Hello, and welcome to the third or fourth Constellations podcast. This is going to be one that's mostly focused on the magic system since I had a lot of questions, mostly about the magic system and then different types of magic. So this one's going to be a really huge exposition dump, but it'll be fun, so <laughs> if that makes sense. So we're going to get all the more basic questions out of the way first, and then we're going to go into the whole magic system thing. So <laughs> let's get started because this is probably going to take three hours. <laughs> so um, one of the most, one of the more basic questions I got was where to start reading Constellations AU, as we like to call it. Um, and I think I answered that one just in case people weren't sure how to start. I don't, I think I make it pretty easy to find, but just in case people aren't sure, it's, we start with the constellations within us and then we go to the epilogue, which is currently being worked on. And then after that, there's a whole bunch of like, other ideas or things that I thought of while in the universe. So everything that is Constellations verse is going to be in the whole Watch the Stars series because I just have to put it, I just have to put it in a place. It has to go somewhere in my brain. So I had to make a series so it made sense. Um, but everything is in order there. So if you just follow what's in the series, you should be fine. Um, later on, there might be some confusing things, but that's because it's just me playing around with dolls. So <laughs> it may or may not make sense, but that's what fanfic is for, just playing around. So now to get into more like character specific questions and kind of ones that are more specific to the epilogue. Um, so... The first one we have is, has Wukong been building relationships with other characters? That is a very good question. And it's one that I can't, I mean, I can't answer, but it's something I can't show you because in the epilogue, we're not focused on Wukong. Like for once, it's not about him. <laughs> so um, that's not something that Macaque would know about. So that's not brought up or talked about too much, but in the epilogue we are going we are working through months it's been like four months already and the chapter titles were supposed to be a more concrete of conveying a more concrete way of conveying that because they were going to say like here's the month and the year and the day but that was kind of boring so I was like let's change that but so far it's been like I think four months and I think I mentioned that in the epilogue by saying something about the season. So it'll say, McCack will usually say something about, oh, it's late summer or something about the summer sun or something. So you know it's in summer. Then when we go to the other seasons, you'll see him say something about fall or whatever. That's like an easier way for me to tell you what season it is. And it's also like a way to show without the character just outright saying, oh, it's you know, it's fall because who says that? Who goes out and is like, hmm, it's a nice day today. It's fall. You know, I mean, maybe people do say that. Maybe they do. Maybe that's normal. But I was just like, that's a little bit weird to have someone remark every time they visit a place like, oh, it's summer. So it's hot. But maybe that's not too weird. But I just felt it was kind of kind of a little bit too blatant. That's something that's more in character for like Wukong actually to be like, oh, this weather is very summery or very fall-like. It's beautiful because he notices all these things in the atmosphere and stuff that are more in tune to the elements. Like he's more in tune to like appreciating beauty. So he will describe things in a way that Macaque doesn't. So it's easier to do it for Wukong, but since this is not Wukong's perspective, it's a little bit harder because Macaque is like, I don't care what season it is <laughs> type of stuff. He only cares if it directly affects him. So if it's hot, he's like, oh, this is a bother 
or if it's cold, he's like, this is great. <laughs> so, um, so Wukong has been building relationships with other characters. It's just been something we haven't been able to see. So, for instance, while these, while these um, walks with Macaque have been going on, Wukong has been going to see, um, I don't think he's seen the Demon Bull King family yet, but he's definitely gone to see Nija. And he's probably hung out with MK a few times and, you know, Tang in a group setting. So he's hung out with MK's, you know, group, the monkey kids, if you will, in a group setting. And I think at this point, he's probably trying to figure out how he's going to talk to May and apologize. And that was something I was thinking about making a little aside to after the epilogue, because I don't want it to be something that's like, oh, you just ignored that. No, there's just a lot going on. And if there's like a lot of serious conversations that are happening and that takes, that's like something extra I have to do because that's not the focus of Constellations right now. It's not about May. Sorry. I mean, not that I hate May. It's just, it's just, it's just not about her right now, but that would be something I would potentially set aside and write later. So it, it's something that he is currently working on right now is that whole talk. Cause it's, that's a heavy talk that's going to be happening. So he's trying to prepare himself for that while also <laughs> trying to prepare his relationship with the cat. Like he's got a lot going on, but I think he has like gone and talked to Naja. And he's currently talking to Macaque and he's um, also probably trying to figure out how he's going to hang out with the DBK family. I think he wants to make out with May first because sometime during that whole, sometime during the whole, while he's hanging out with the monkey kids, it probably came up that May is dating Red Sun. And this is just a reminder, Constellations is canon to season three so since red sun and may got together or whatever in season three that's in here and everything up to season three is canon here season four and forward is not so that is something that he would do before going to talk to red sun is uh talk to may so it's kind of that's where his mind is right now in the epilogue it's like he's definitely working on it but it is something that he's taking his time doing because he understands that especially since he's been hanging out with macaque he needs to be careful with how he talks and how he interacts with people and how he works on these um relationships because he also understands it's different for every person so it's like he wants to treat those moments with respect so he's kind of like being cautious and he's um trying to take his time about it which i think is very smart of him to do so yeah, that is what he's doing currently, and he is working on that slowly. Um, next question is, will Naja and DBK family be in the epilogue? Um, no. The epilogue is really focused on Shadow Peach. I mean, not Shadow Peach. It's really focused on Macaque, and Shadow Peach is just, you know, in, you know, it's about them walking so shadow peach is in there but it's really about macaque getting into his mindset and figuring out why he feels the way he feels and how he's feeling from month to month about wukong and how that changes over time there's not really time for me to go and work on the dbk family while working on this that would be um very it would seem out there. It'd be like, wait, what are we doing over here? That kind of feeling like I, when I set the tone for the epilogue just in the first chapter, this is what we're going to be doing 16 times is this and just working on how their relationship changes over time because this is important because of how we go forward. We can't do anything in Constellations AU until this is worked out. So that's why the epilogue is important. It's like now that they've done their initial talk in the mirror what happens next and then it's okay they need to work on this slowly and how long would that take and what would it look like that's kind of what the epilogue is about if so like i said with may talking to the dbk family would be like another aside and that's not something 
that is not something I feel is necessary right now. Plus, I think I said in a ask somewhere that the DBK family whole, their whole um, history and stuff isn't, I haven't 100% planned that out. I have a general idea, but like, I'd have to figure out, you know, like, let's take Princess Iron Fan. There's a whole bunch of lore about her, so I'd have to go dive into her lore. Not in the show. <laughs> Just, you know, in the, in the, um, as a character overall. So I'd have to go into her lore and figure out, like, what specifically I want her to do within the celestial realm that is closer to the show and, like, what, like, where she came from and what she's been doing and then working Journey to the West stuff in there and then how did. I mean, we know how she met DBK because of season four, but like, what if that needs to change and constantly constellations of you because it doesn't make sense or the timing is off, then we have to do the whole, um, because then it's like they met Wukong on the journey. There was this whole fight. So then I have to work that in there. And then it's like, well, Red Sun was born and Red Sun was also in, um, of course, Journey to the West and he fought Wukong and then got super punished. But like... <laughs> Those are all things I have to like think about in time and place. And it's like, I, I mean, with these questions about what is Wukong doing? What is Nizha and what is the DBK family doing to talk about those things and give them the proper respect? I would have to take time to do that. And that's, that's a whole, that's a big part of the process of writing is figuring out, okay, here's the timeline and here's what these characters are doing. And that takes a lot of work. And I've already done that work with Shadow Peach and like the main cast or Stone Fruit Trio. So I'm trying to like work that out before we branch out to other people. It's like Constellations AU right now, if I had to like sum it up in arcs or something, I would be like right now with Constellations, the Constellations within us in the epilogue is very like, let's point out the let's point out the problem of Macaque and Wukong not being able to talk to each other. What happened there? Let's fix it. Oh, Macaque's cursed. What's going on with that? Let's fix it. Then what happens after that? When he's like, what happens with the curse? Does it get fixed? Does it not? That type of thing. That's what we're doing right now is fixing that, fixing the relationship and then dealing with the curse and what that means. And, you know, one of these things bleeds into another one. It's like a good example of this is just with the show. When season two bled into season three, like it's set up each, each season is set up for the next one kind of, except like kind of three to four was a little bit not as clean as we're used to. Two to three was a little bit more like you knew about the lady bone demon before season three happened. And you're like, Oh, that that's who she is. It's that kind of thing. Like one thing, one thing bleeds into the next and influences the next thing. So this one is really about f like working on Shadow Peach things and then moving forward. There was a question about, or, you know, people are asking about Stone Fruit Trio and how after chapter six of the epilogue, how everybody's doing now, um, which is a really good question. It's also a very cute question because I think everybody's in a really good place in the trio, like as far as their whole relationship goes with each other and how MK now has two mentors. Like MK really loves just from that first lesson. There is so much more structure and foundation for these lessons there, like at that point and then going forward that it was... I think it was a little bit of a shock to him. I don't think if I, I don't think I had time to convey that because it wasn't in his perspective, but he was like really shocked that there was like a lesson and they had a demonstration ready. Like he was like, what? Usually, I think usually just based on the show, the way that the lessons would go is that Wukong would have an idea of something and he would be like, oh, we haven't done this yet. And he'd be like, okay, MK, we're going to tackle this. And MK's like, oh, okay. And they just kind of go with it, go with the flow that way. This is a little bit more like we have lessons planned for every single spell in all these subsets of magic already ready. And we can just pull them out. But it's 
in an order that they have chosen to create and dictate that they spent time doing. And that whole discussion about it and them telling MK that really showed MK that they're taking this seriously and that they are like 100% behind teaching him. Of course they are. They were before. But now it's like, yeah, they're working together to do this and they have already started independently. Like they haven't like sat down. They didn't sit MK down while they were doing that and been like, okay, what do you think we should do? Or like, you know, they kind of just were like, let's be, let's be actual mentors and decide on what we want to do and then do it. And then, you know, lesson plan, basically their lesson planning. So, and that's really Macaque's influence. I'm not saying that Wukong does not have lesson plans, but he kind of just like thinks about in his head, like, hmm, 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 what have I not taught MK yet? I haven't taught him how to do this yet. Or, oh, we need to work on this type of fighting. Or we haven't really worked on like dodging and parrying yet. We should do that. It's kind of like really nonchalant. It's on the spur, like spur of the moment type stuff. This is like MK shows up and he's like, I know that they're going to know what to teach me today. Like I like just out the get. So he's like really happy about it. And he likes the information he's getting about the spells because as Macaque says, as Macaque said, which Wukong told him is that MK can't have too much information because that's a lot to handle. And he kind of gets like flustered or overwhelmed. So it's like small chunks. And they kind of incorporated that. They told him the bare minimum. They were like, this is the wood spell. This is what you're going to do. Here's the words. Here's the motion. Try it yourself. And MK was able to do that without any pressure or like anybody over his shoulder hovering over him or like the world is at stake or his friends are in danger. It was just like, try it. See if you can do it. If you can't, it's okay. But try on your own first and then we'll come back and we'll help, you know, we'll figure it out together. It was a, it was really supportive and not saying that Wukong was not supportive, but it helps to have another person there to be like, okay, I have this different perspective. I'm seeing what the problem is, or I'm seeing like what we can do better to help MK in his specific way of learning. So it's really beneficial for MK, of course, but it's just beneficial for everybody because Wukong is able to see how structure helps people learn and like routine helps people learn. And uh, Macaque is able to see how MK is influenced by emotion and how sometimes the laid back way of doing lessons is beneficial too. Like he's not, it's not entirely bad. It's not inherently bad. It's just like putting a little bit more structure and thought into it was, is like more beneficial in the long run. And he's very, like MK is very happy that they took the time out of their day to do that for him. He's very happy about it. So it's, it's, it's really, um, I mean, MK feels really good about it. He's, that was a good first lesson. And he's like, this, this is, this feels right. And he's like, I, it, he, it, he was able to leave that lesson feeling proud of himself, accomplished, got some more confidence, was happy. Um, I was also happy that Macaac and Wukong seemed to be getting along because they were alone together for an hour. And he's like, wow, I sure don't hear screams or cries of terror or shrieking. So that's good. So it was good for him overall. Um, Wukong and Macaque learned a lot about each other and their different ways of teaching, both in chapter three and in chapter six, because we see Wukong just trying to go back and be like, I don't want to make MK feel like he's abandoned. And MK didn't feel that way. He did not take them leaving for an hour as Wukong being like, okay, you figure it out on your own, because he didn't, they didn't do that. They told MK exactly what he needed to know. And he understands that that's what they were doing. He has ev he had everything that he needed and he was nervous because he's like feeling that internal pressure of I have to get this right the first time I have to do it right. But then when they both assured him like it's OK if you don't, it's OK if you make mistakes and you need to stop comparing yourself to us. You need to stop thinking you have to do everything right the first time. Nobody does. It's kind of like hammering those lessons in and just repeating them over and over again until MK's like, OK, 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 I believe you. That kind of stuff is like really beneficial to him. So he was not upset with either of them for just leaving for an hour. He was like, okay, let me try this on my own. And I think that was like really beneficial for him to like, cause he needed that time to just think and like get himself together. It, that was a good call on their part to do. 
Um, but, you know, it did highlight some misunderstandings they both have with each other, even though they kind of came to an understanding in the forest. They were like, yeah, we need to give MK some independence so that he can stand on his own if we're not there, if something does happen. And it's like, that's not something that Wukong likes to confront because he has problems processing his trauma, as we'll talk about later. But it's, and he doesn't like giving into that feeling of like, bad things are going to happen, just out, they're going to happen regardless. So it's best to be prepared for those bad things as best you can, not to like overly prepare or stress, but just, you know, have confidence in yourself that you can tackle things that come your way. That's what Macaque is wanting which is a very important skill to have, especially if we look into the context, this is where he's fighting demons <laughs> and like powerful demons, like world destroying de demons. So he does need to have that confidence to think on the, on the fly, which is something Maca Wukong has, but he's forgetting. It's like hard to like sit there and remember like, oh, I was not like this in the beginning. It took a lot of fighting for me to get this and this knowledge of how to like tackle things and like, remain calm somewhat in the face of all this danger and just think logically or like think quickly uh, and come up with a solution. Like Wukong is not perfect at that, but he is, he's done it quite a few times. So he's like able to handle most things. Um, but that's something MK has to learn. And that's what Macaque wants them to focus on whilst he's learning elemental spells. And I think they came to kind of an understanding at the end there. Um, so for now, they're going to follow the curriculum and teach MK elemental spells. They, he, they did wood. So that's kind of taken care of. Other than that, um, after I, I forgot the order, is it water next? <laughs> I think it's water next. Um, they might do a healing spell because healing is connected to wood, of course, for restoration. So teaching him basic healing, like to heal cuts and, uh, minor burns, Healing, like minor healing spells are probably what they're going to focus on next. And then water, like a basic spell for control for water is what they will probably do after that. Um, but I just want to add on to the end that Wukong, like after that first lesson, he admits that Macaque's insight and ex explanations are valuable to the whole learning process and also like valuable to him because he likes listening to Macaque explain magic because who doesn't? And also... Um, McCack understands like on the opposite end of that, that Wukong's energy and emotional viewpoint is also really val valuable, like that encouragement and that like constant encouragement from Wukong can kind of seem like too much and like cringy or whatever, but it's like, there's a point to it. And he's like trying to get MK to understand because if the monkey king is telling you <laughs> that you are doing a good job and you are doing great, then eventually you would, you know, a fan or someone who's just heard the stories or whatever would be like, oh yeah, that's true. And Wukong is just like, if I keep telling him, telling MK that over and over again, eventually it's going to sink in. So yeah, that's it for how stone fruit tree are feeling. Okay, so now that those types, I wanted to get those questions solved really quickly, but now we can get into the nitty gritty, which is the magic system. Yay! Yay, aren't we all excited to just talk about magic for three hours? <laughs> um, so um, I put things in a kind of, I ordered things in a way that I think I can blend into each subject really well. There's a lot of questions, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I think I put them in order in a way and I have like notes. So let's hope that this works. Um, so the first question is like how the magic system was created and then what was the mag what was the inspiration behind it? And that's a really good question. <laughs> um, how was it created and what was the inspiration? I think, well, here's, okay. I thought it was going to be hard. It's not hard. Okay. <laughs> the answer to that is it's based on the show. And by that, I mean to create a magic system that is can like as close to canon and explains things in the show. I had to go through the show and like take note of every spell and every um, bit of magic or weird happening 
and write all those things down and then be like, okay, we have these spells that take place in the show that are not explained and just happen. And it's like, how do we explain these in a way that the audience can understand? So I'm like, um, let's take, and it was, it was kind of easy because not easy. Let's not, (laughs) it was kind of, some moments were easy because we saw, because MK was learning at the same time. So let's talk about that one episode in season one or whatever, where he learns how to make clones. It was like duplication and he made all those clones or whatever. So since that's like a monkey king power, I'm like, okay, this is something that was in Journey to the West. Like a lot of these powers. So then like you consult the actual original material of Journey to the West and just um, each one of, like, <laughs> it's so funny because in the novel, they, he lists the number of hairs or, yeah, the number of hairs Mc- Wukong actually has on his person. I was like, that's really specific. Anyway, <laughs> but Wukong can take one of those pieces of hair and blow on it and transform it into anything. And it's like this really interesting bout of magic. Like, he can just blow on it and it's anything. So it's like, that's transformation. Just out the get that's what he's doing he's transforming his hair into something else that's said multiple times over the over the over the novel and he would transform it into different things different items different you know he would do everything you know those hairs were like super integral to the whole fucking journey that's what he did the most i think is transformation um but and then elemental but like anyway since um so i had to go back and explain that and i think in the original text not there's so many translations when i say that i just mean in journey to the west it's explained that it's through spirit so i'm like okay through spirit he transforms his hair and i was like so by blowing on it he is imbuing it with some type of magic and i was like okay if we so one of the tenets of this magic system is spirit so we can use spirit to do different things so that's how that part of the magic system was made like you basically i'm basically dice i okay i basically dissected spells and then made up explanations for them so like i like transformation is now spirit he imbues spirit into his hair to get it to transform that is how mk does it that is how it is done but that is why that's how this whole thing was made is I would break I would basically make a list of spells and break them apart and then explain them and then I would write down those explanations and that is the basis for a magic system because so I'm working backwards usually (laughs) you would be like okay let's make the magic system first then I will have the characters know that magic system and then they can do spells and magic and I can it's explained so then you know how this character is using magic you know it's just like oh you know the owl house they explain the magic system in like the first episode like what is it all these witch all the witches have like a magical sack or something (laughs) and they're able to like do that little circle sign and they can do magic that way But Luz has to use the glyphs to do it because she doesn't have that magical aspect in her body. That is explaining the magic system and how people can use it throughout the show. That's what I had to do, but I was doing it backwards. And I had to do that in order to make this work. So that was how it was created. Um, For another explanation really quickly, elemental magic, um, I went to the original text again. And Wukong really likes to use elemental magic. And he would mostly use it to talk to the spirits of the elements and be like, hey, can you can you clear the sky up? Or or like, hey, can you do this? Or it was just like sometimes he would ask if it was like a big ask, something that affected like the entire region of the world he was in. Like, I'm we're in a magical competition and I need to beat these guys. And I need to prove to them that I'm stronger. So can you guys help me clear out the clouds or something like that? And then the spirits would help him clear out the clouds. Um, And it was funny because he also just intimidated them into doing it. He was like, I'm the monkey king and you're going to do what I say. Like everyone was kind of scared of him, (laughs) which is super funny. But anyway, 
that's where elemental comes from. It's like when you do elemental magic, you are directing your magic to interact with the element that you want by making the motion. And when you're interacting with an element, it is specific in that an element is like wind. When Wukong mentions wind in constellations, he's like, oh, the wind loves MK. He's able to talk to it and the wind reassures him that he'll be safe and all that. He says wind generally and broadly, but it's like the wind as an element is made up of like a choir of people. It's like a think of like people in a choir for the wind in every element. So it's like, and that is like the spirits, like it's the wind interacting and like being able to be spoken to or being able to hear what the wind is saying is like, you are in tune with those spirits and they are bestowing their blessing or love or devotion onto you. And it's like, because there's so many, it kind of has to be that way because in Journey to the West, it's like there would be spirits in specific regions and places like there'd be spirits wind spirits of the north or over the east or wind spirits of this mountain or wind spirits of this uh area in this valley area in this valley and there were so many and it's like so how can we get them all in agreement it's like it's kind of like they're not a hive mind because they can make their own individual choices but they're just aware of what all the other spirits are thinking so it's like the choir as a whole is like, oh, yes, we love MK. Every, all, the whole wind, everybody, <laughs> all the spirit, all the wind spirits are like, yeah, MK is our favorite now. <laughs> we just decided. So it's kind of like that, if that makes sense. it's It has to be that way to make sense with um, just elemental magic, but also just how it worked in the original text. So it's like water. Since Macaque was born from sea foam, the water spirits are more in tune to him, so they're more they're more e- they're like more eager to help him. They respond easier to him because they're like, "Oh, you were made of water. You know what water is. You understand what it takes, what its strengths, its weaknesses. We can sense water in you. We sense that level of understanding. So we are going to be more amenable to helping you and more friendly towards you. In that, it's going to be easier to dir- to direct us to do things because you have that connection. It's the same thing with Wu Kong and. Um, earth and metal and the earth and metal spirits are really like (laughs) stubborn and um irritated very like hard to get them to do things but they always come when wukong needs him needs something earth or metal related and that is how it works with mk and wood so the wood spirits are like oh shit it's mk we have to fucking show up and show out that type of thing if that makes sense i'm hoping that makes sense That is how it works. I don't think I conveyed that in Constellations too well. I meant to, but I'm like, I don't, it's really weird to word it in a way that would make sense and not confuse you. So I put the wind as what it is, because that's true, but it's like made up of multiple spirits altogether, if that makes sense. That was a really long tangent, and that was not part of the question, (laughs) but um. So the main inspiration for the magic system was just the show and Journey to the West and I guess just the body, (laughs) like the body, uh, just drawing inspiration from like, how would you be able to do that? Or what would you need to do? Like if there's illusion magic in Lego Monkey Kid, they use illusions all the time. My cat does. So I was like, okay, how do I explain illusion magic? And I'm like, well, illusions are visualization. You're thinking about what you want to cast. And then it's like, maybe they make like a sign with their hands or something to enact that cast. That's So it was kind of like inspiration from a lot of things, but it's mostly from the show and the book because I it had to come from somewhere. And doing that made it feel more authentic because it's like, oh, this makes sense. And it kind of fits with the source material in the show because I worked backwards. So then it's like, oh, now I know how MK did that. Like I had that post where it's like, how did MK build his mech? And I was like, well, now I can explain that to you. He used manip- manipulation magic. He had, he directed his magic to interact with the world around him and manip- manipulated it to build a mech without even knowing what he was doing. 
So it's like he taught himself that. So, and it's possible to do that. You can stumble upon how spells work easily because there's different ways to like learn magic. There's a traditional way, as they talked about in the epilogue, where you <laughs> like are told these things, but like you can stumble upon it because the magic system is drawn from mind and heart and spirit and soul and being. So it's like if you have since a lot of spells are drawn from the heart, if you just feel something strong enough, you could cast a spell. You know, that's why magic is versatile, but it's also very dangerous. Um, and we needed that to happen to explain some of the weird things that happened in the show. Like, why did MK get powered up all of a sudden? How can all these people make MK stronger? Well, it's because of his heart and how that can influence magic. Okay, so what we go into a possession spell in this magic system. Um, possession spell is requires the soul slash being. I say soul slash being, but I'm like, basically it's like the soul plus mind plus spirit. So it's like soul, mind, and spirit have to go into a possession spell. Lady Bone Demon used a possession spell on Wukong. So she used soul, her soul, her mind, and her spirit to cast that death magic possession spell into Wukong and that's how he got slowly taken over. It's like when those little ghosts went into him, think of that as like her spirit slash soul being sent into him and then possessing him from the inside, taking over his mind, taking over his body, making him do whatever she wants him to do. Um, that is how it would work. Uh, it That is like slightly advanced magic. You know, not everybody can do that. And it takes a lot because you have to like, that's like, okay, like cloud somersault, like cloud, wow. Like how cloud somersaulting takes constant magic to keep that cloud going. That's the same thing with possession. You have to keep constant magic. You know, you have to keep your hold on that person as long as you can, which is why she couldn't do it. And she was like breaking apart because <laughs> that's a lot of magic to control the monkey king. <laughs> so you're like, Ugh. mistakes may have been made. <laughs> um, so that's how it would work. Um, what would go into a resurrection spell and what would be the process of the corpse? So for a resurrection, uh, that is also highly advanced magic. That is like the highest tier of, because resurrection is like, oof, it's, it's really like not something that is done too often because it's like with how the, um, magic system works and just how the afterlife is, it's like, well, we have the 10 Kings of Hell have a whole, as we discussed in epilogue chapter five i think was it five i don't know as we discussed in that one chapter there is a whole court system that souls go through in order to become reincarnated so there is like already a process in place for if someone dies this is what they go through then they get reincarnated into one of the other realms so this person could get reincarnated as a deer as a deer animal or a fish i don't know <laughs> like it's it's whatever the ten kings of hell think because they weigh that person's sins their choices how they acted in life uh you know their family can give offerings you know to the ten kings of hell and just put them on their grave and then that influences their decision so it's all these elements coming together that's why paperwork is super important in the realm of dead just overall in both realms but in the realm of the dead they fucking need that paperwork anyway like so there's already a resurrection slash reincarnation process in place. So casting a resurrection spell is like, what? <laughs> it's like, what the f I mean, it's not, not that it doesn't ever happen. It happens, but it's kind of like, what is happening? Why? <laughs> so Lady Bone Demon doing that for a macaque is like, why do you want him? <laughs> but she did it and resurrection requires soul, mind, spirit, heart, and blood. So it's like, it is super powerful and it takes so much. It takes literally everything but touch, visualization, and motion, and a sign. So it takes like everything else. It's five things. So you have these five things. You have these, you have to have those five things in order to resurrect somebody. So you would basically put part of your soul. You need your mind to do this. You need your spirit to do this because you're rec you're resurrecting somebody. You're resurrecting a soul. <laughs> so you need your spirit. You need emotional 
investment from your heart, you also need blood. So it's like, you also need blood from like a uh, person. <laughs> Sorry. She was, well, I mean, Lady Bone would not be above killing somebody, but like, you know, just some blood. Could it be animal blood? Eh, yeah, but it might not go as well. It would probably be best if it was like mortal blood. <laughs> you know, you know how it goes. You know how it goes. So basically you get all these, you get the blood, you get the blood and then, um, you know, those, um, what are those called? Those like circles, those those magic circles they have, the arcane symbol circles. Like Tang has his like celestial ones. Lady Bone Demon had de death ones. So she would basically do that, get one of those circles going to co to connect with the uh, realm of the dead because she's resurrecting somebody. So she'd get the blood on there, splash some blood on there and get your heart and soul into it. Put your mind and spirit, visual not visualize, but think about who you are trying to resurrect. Think about why. Think about your goal. And then you're casting the spell. You are basically calling. Think of, you're just making a call to the realm of the dead. And I explained this in chapter five, but it's like King Yon is like the overall king of hell. Like he's like the top dog down there. So he's like, he picks up the phone call and he's like, so what, what is going on? <laughs> Why do you want to resurrect this person? I see from your spell that you are trying to resurrect a celestial primate um, macaque, the six-eared macaque, born from sea foam, with the intent to bring him back for revenge purposes. Can you like tell me what's up with that? Then she would like explain, I need this soul for this purpose. We, I'm trying to make a deal. So she's like, he's like, okay, if macaque agrees to this deal then the resurrection spell will be a success if he does not then it will be rescinded and you will have to clean up the blood and stuff <laughs> and recover because it takes a lot of magic so like you know deal with that but macaque accepted the deal so king yon allowed his soul to go back up to the mortal realm and that's how it would work how that works in like and i go into this also in the epilogue later on how that works for the uh corpse is like wherever macaque was last wherever his body was last the blood that the lady bone demon used is put back into that body a piece of her soul a piece of her spirit is put back into that body so then it reinvigorates the body in that way so then it like the body jump starts his macaque's soul is returned from the realm of the dead. He's got that blood from the spell. He's got a piece of soul. He's got a piece of spirit from the lady bone demon who did this to him to help reinvigorate his body. So then his body like slowly comes back to life. And it's like um, kind of zombie-ish movements for a while. Once, and it's also like... This is why this, this is why the resurrection spell requires a piece of soul and some spirit is because now not not just for connecting to the realm of the dead because that's what the soul part is because death magic requires soul to to cast any death magic spell it requires a piece of your core self your being so she it but it also has to do with reinvigorating macaque's corpse with the power to regenerate magic of its own because he's dead so he doesn't have any <laughs> like his corpse does not have magic so now it's like you're jump starting you have to get the whole thing going again like think of like an old like manufacturing facility when it's like not been in use forever then you turn on the lever or whatever then everything starts working you have all these cobwebs on things some things are like rickety rusted that type of stuff has to happen it takes a little bit for it to get back up to snuff and even then some things are broken and chipped or whatever so you have to go find these things and be like oh i have to fix that i have to fix that that's kind of what's going on it's like macag comes out of the ground and he's like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> i don't have any magic so i have to wait for that to happen i need to heal myself because of the fight so he's he's still got like he's still fucked up from the fight like his eye <laughs> is fucked up um and it also like restores like because I, I mean at this point he's definitely like it's you know skeleton so the whole thing with the blood is like 
returning that corpse to be how it was before death. Like how he looked when he got sent initially to the realm of the dead. So he look, he's looking gangly and fucked up from that fight with Wukong. So he's like, I need to heal myself. He can't do it until his magic regenerates. Once it does, he casts a healing spell. It's not as satisfying or correct as he's used to because he has been resurrected and he's imbued with death magic from the resurrection. Plus that curse is still there because it's like he's resurrected from how he came to the realm of the dead. When Wukong killed him, he still had that curse on. So he still has the curse when he comes back to life. When he realized that, he was super upset. But <laughs> that's how it is. So that is how um, the process with the corpse would happen. Okay, the next question is, can a problem occur if one's magic were to stay too long in another person? Would it eventually mix in, dissolve, or corrupt? Um... I want to start this by talking about bond magic because I think that's what this question is referring to. And the magic from bond magic is specific in that it will not have any adverse effects unless like that's agreed upon in the bond or whatever, like whatever the conditions of the bond are. If it's, if there's like a time limit or something, then it could lead to problems. But most of the time, the magic is just going to sit there and not do anything because it's tied to the bond. So um, you're basically just giving a little piece of your magic to the other person and holding on to it until the favor or whatever the conditions are met. Then the magic goes right back to where it was. So that bond magic is not going to dissolve or corrupt or do anything like that. It's just going to stay in its place. Bond magic can be manipulated, though. Like, Macaque does this a few times to check Wukong's um, body for illness and also just to mess around and fuck with him and stuff like that. That can happen, but the bond magic can't be taken out or removed unless the bond has been fulfilled. So that's a specific case. But this is a good time to talk about corruption magic. I initially had corruption magic marked down as a type of spell like illusion magic and transformation magic corruption magic was like that where you could cast a corruption spell i changed that because i think that would lead to a lot of problems world building wise and just continuity wise i think i think it's dangerous to be able to have characters be able to cast a corruption spell with the intent to corrupt another person so there, it's not corruption magic anymore. It's just corruption. And corruption is just when things interact or magic interacts in a way it wasn't intended to. So a good example of this is with the magical artifacts from constellations that Wukong had to hunt down. Those three artifacts were fine until the Lady Bone Demon got her hands on them and used them with her death magic. And then they changed in purpose and, you know, they were reversed. They could do the opposite of what they were meant to do. And that's because magical artifacts are infused with magic. They have power inside them. They have these special conditions. There's things that only they can do, you know, they're magical objects. So putting even more magic into those objects can cause corruption because corruption occurs when magic interaction weight wasn't intended to. So that is what happened with those artifacts. That is also what happened with Wukong's eyes. Wukong was in that furnace, which is an artifact. And then he had those potions inside of his body, which is like magic inside of him. And then he has social magic inside of him. And then there was fire, so that didn't help. So all these things came together to create corruption because there were so many things going on. There was a lot of magic in that furnace and it was interacting. And whenever that happens, weird things can occur, which is corruption, which is why Wukong's eyes got corrupted and how he was able to make a spell through that concentrated celestial magic in his eyes. It like corruption can lead to bad things and good things. 
So because it's just a chemical reaction, sometimes it can be positive. Sometimes it can be negative. Sometimes it can be very negative. So it's like it's meant to just be something that can happen if people are irresponsible or something goes wrong or somebody uses a, a artifact wrong or a magical object wrong, you know, because magical art objects and artifacts have, you know, sometimes spells put on them, like the scroll with the earth monkeys that had a spell on it, spells on it. <laughs> uh, so that's a magical object. So if somebody used magic in an incorrect way on that scroll, it could lead to corruption of the object and also the user of the magic because it's like backfiring you know corruption is just it's a punishment for things for when things aren't done correctly or with care magic is very powerful and it can be influenced by emotion and all these things but it can also hurt people very easily and that's why it's important to be taught you know the right the right way to cast magic um, but the question was specifically if magic were to stay too long in another person, what would happen? And that depends on the type of magic. I'm trying not to over explain this and corruption is very difficult to explain because it's just unexpected occurrences and Macaque said as much. It's like, you, it's hard to explain corruption magic until the effects are seen then you can like go backwards and deduce how did this corruption happen? Then you can figure it out backwards, kind of like I did for the magic system. <laughs> but um, when putting like magic inside of another person, that is like highly specific. And I don't think that happens too often. It's usually just people flinging attack spells or destruction spells or elemental spells at each other. Um, but let's say a celestial being had death magic inside of them. That could potentially lead to corruption if the celestial being tried to cast a celestial spell in the celestial magic, touch the death magic or something like that. And they didn't play nice together or, you know, whatever spell that was trying to be cast was not the right one to do, <laughs> something like that. Like maybe if they tried to cast a restoration spell then the death magic inside of them was like, nope, don't do that. And so a corruption happened, maybe. And then the corruption could be anything. Maybe that divine being can't cast restoration spells anymore. Maybe their hand that they were using to direct the magic is corrupted by death magic. Or it's like it can't be healed ever again. You know, anything like that can happen. Um, but that's just with death magic inside of another person. If it is... A spell like a death magic spell that increases the likelihood of corruption if someone puts like a death magic destruction spell into a divine being the destruction could interact with the celestial magic in a very bad way so the intent and purpose with the spell you know being cast and put into somebody means that it's going to go off so, you know, destruction in a celestial being, maybe they try and heal the destruction while before it can happen or something. They try to dispel it. That could cause some corruption if they used any kind of magic, any kind of celestial magic, it could cause corruption. Um, but it's hard to like say exactly what will happen. But once it happens and you like look at the conditions, you can be like, oh, I see how that corruption happened after the fact. So it's really hard to explain how corruption happens it's just like anytime there's like magic interacting in a way it's not intended to or it's two objects two magical objects you know too close together or somebody casts a spell on a magical artifact that they should not cast um it can lead to some trouble and it can be minor trouble it can be severe trouble like, let's say corruption magic is has all kinds of, it's a, a scale, I think, you know, it could be minor. The corruption could be minor. It could be, there was death magic inside of me, 
and I cast a celestial spell, whatever. And there was some corruption and it turned my heart blue. And that, you know, <laughs> isn't a big deal, but it's corrupted now. Um, but it can also be pretty severe, like what happened with Wukong's eyes. And Wukong's eyes still function the same way, but, you know, they are very drastically changed. And I don't, I guess that's not severe. There's an even higher tier of corruption magic because it's, it can be, it can go as bad as you think it can go. Like, you know, it can, it depends on the spells that are used and how much magic is used in those spells. Um, I think it is easier for celestial magic and death magic though like the one of those two things has to be involved in corruption is more likely to occur as well because celestial and death magic both require the soul to be cast like you have to use a part of your soul to cast celestial magic so in death magic so so i think with those two pillars of magic it's easier to get corruption involved because you know since it's cast with the soul that's you that's like integral to you that's you as a person so you know it's easier that it's easier for corruption to occur but so i guess in the grand scheme of things it could dissolve if somebody's magic is in another person for too long it could dissolve it could corrupt depending on what that person does if they cast spells like willy nilly and don't care, or if they just don't do anything and let it just sit there and go away eventually, or take it out themselves after they get an understanding, after they get an understanding of the type of magic, they could just take it out themselves. Um, I'm not sure if it would dissolve. Maybe, maybe over time, over a long time. But I think it would be best to just remove it or get someone else to remove it for you if you could. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry if that explanation is not very good, but that's how corruption works. Um, for curses, curses are spells woven intentionally. So it's like a curse is a weaving of spells. So let's dissect Macaque's curse, which he has done numerous times. The He cannot cast advanced magic he can he is haunted by nightmares well he's haunted by ghosts and he has nightmares so the whole nightmare thing is a sleep spell um the haunting of ghosts is death magic and the advanced magic is a type of restriction that usually heaven or hell uses, you know, for punishment. So that's a spell too. And it's like a restricted, it's a, probably, it is probably like restriction. You know, there's all kinds of spells that only heaven and hell have access to like resurrection. Um, and I, the Jade Emperor said this in the first chapter of Constellations or the second where he's like, there's advanced spells and he has to give clearance to people to learn those spells. So these are advanced spells that make up Macaque's curse. And the Ten Kings of Hell took these three or four spells, well, however many spell names, is, however many spells, they took these spells and wove them together and created a curse and then cast all those spells at Macaque at once. Um... So that's different than corruption magic because you are like, since corruption magic is like a chemical reaction and you don't know what's going on or whatever, curses are like, you know, you know, ex you know explicitly what spells are in that curse. You can figure that out. And the other person definitely knows. That's why the Marvel trio was like, it's easier for the other person or the person who cast the curse to get rid of it because they know the spells involved. Um, so that is the difference with curses. It's like, you just have these three spells and you can try and cancel them out or like, I, I don't, I don't, there's not too much you can do except ask the other person to stop or get divine help. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's different. It's difficult to get rid of curses because of how intently they are crafted. Like they are crafted very meticulously. The 10 Kings of hell were meticulous in their selection of spells for this curse and it's advanced magic. So my cat can't counter that, especially if he's cursed, he can't do anything. Um, so those are, that's kind of the difference. And I hope that's easy to understand. If it's not, please leave a comment or send an ask and I'll try again. But basically corruption just can't really be explained perfectly. And it just happens, you know? And when it involves death magic and celestial magic, that increases the likelihood of some weird shit going on. If you put celestial magic or death magic into beings who don't know how that magic works, then corruption could very well take place um, because they're tied to the soul. So, and then if you switch, if you put in some magical objects in there, some artifacts, it's very dangerous. So I guess just take that, I guess is the answer. I hope that answered the question. Okay, I need a little magic system break. I'm sure you guys do, because I'm like, oh, I'm sure I fucked something up and I went back and reworked something that I shouldn't have or I told like a lie or something. I'm sure I didn't, but I'm like, also like, perhaps I did though. If I did, it wasn't intentional. Anyway, another question was about MK's magic and his status as a celestial priming just basically... Basically, I feel like this question is like, hey, what the fuck is going on with MK? Which valid? What is going on with it? What's going on with that monkey? That is such, that is, you know. So basically, what is going on with MK and his magic? And why is he so special? And like, he's learning things so quickly. What is going on with him? I think to go into that, we have to go into celestial primate lore as if I haven't done that enough. As if I haven't told you guys everything, you know, but I have to do that here. So let's just start at the beginning. MK is a celestial primate. He's the fourth one. He was born in a fruit grove, which is adorable. And he was born from soil. So the element he connects with most is wood. And so wood magic is easy for him to cast. Um, so... MK's magic being this really potent, strong thing is partly to explain why he's like so adept in the show. Like he catches on really quickly. He teaches himself spells. He kind of doesn't need Wukong for a lot of stuff. <laughs> like he's got it handled, even if he's unsure and scared. Um, so it's kind of to explain that. But it's also like just being a celestial primate, he has an inherent inclination towards magic and can like pick up on these things because that's just part of how celestial primates are they are able to like they're very intuitive and you know it's kind of like it's like when you think of celestial primates think of like all the unfairness <laughs> like I don't know I'm like think of all that frustration of like you working hard to do something, right? You're, you've worked so hard in this uh, skill. You've put a lot of time into it. Years you've put into it. Then someone comes up and they're like off the bat great at it. And it's the first time they've done it. That's a celestial primate. <laughs> they are just, they just try something. And they're like, oh, they're already good at it. Oh, they, they did had no, they had no idea what it was. Oh, they're instantly experts. It's like all that unfairness. And it's like, part it's mostly because they're monkeys you know they're just like hmm I am intuitively smart I can figure this out I can be annoying I can like figure out the right way to dodge your attacks or like mess with you and get in your head and that kind of like mischievousness of a monkey like oh I'm always going to have the upper hand or like I'm always going to be able to beat your ass with a smile and a joke at the end of the day that kind of like because that's you know that's kind of like stemming from Wukong as a character like he was like, he would get out of things in ridiculous ways. Like, it's like, okay, sure, fine, just do that. Pull that spell out of your ass, Wukong. Just, sure, whatever you say. It's that kind of stuff that's like, goes into the celestial primate lore of like how they operate. So since Wukong is like the first, he exemplifies this the best. 
and that he's like over, able to like beat these enemies in weird ways and get into their heads and do nonsensical things and he wins um macaque is like more like trickster i mean not trickster wukong is a trickster macaque is like more strategic and meticulous he will he is mischievous in that he won't use like his powers to like get into people's heads he's really into that and he will like manipulate them um coerce them persuade them that type of thing he really gets into people's heads so he really embodies that trait he's very like cunning and clever little star is very they're um mischievous as well but they're very um energetic uh since little star is the primate of connection and curiosity they're very like personable uh just a lot of more of that charm you know wukong has that charm to like get into people's get on their good side you know you can't help but love them that type of thing little star really has that going for them they are beloved by many people so it's that's kind of what they exhibit or whatever um mk is like he's kind of got all those <laughs> things because he is like very personable people love him he's smart he can be cunning and clever too he is mischievous he can <laughs> think of weird ways to beat people up and and win at the same time so he's kind of got he's kind of a well-rounded mix of all these like traits that make a celestial primate of like how they operate and that type of thing another thing about him and celestial primates in general is like how they develop their abilities over time like wukong went to training yeah but he honed on his elemental magic and all these other types of magic over time and he like gained his titles over time like it's like he can do this and he can do that and he's good at this and it's like something that he built up all the celestial primates are kind of building that building themselves up upset for a little star because they're mia macaque like becoming um master of shadows that type of thing those types of titles build up since he's been dead he hasn't been able to work on his like reputation or anything for too long because it's like the celestial primates are like oddities that everyone just has to deal with like the celestial realm is just like damn it we sure do have four weirdos <laughs> that we just have to like we just have to keep an eye on they're like we can't we just have to keep an eye on them i guess <laughs> we just have to make sure they're not doing anything ter terrible or awful like they're just like those those little weird ones over there in that corner we don't talk about them <laughs> like but you know they're kind of like that has to be highlighted how they're like ostracized there is nobody else like them their their reputations are so specific to them they're like well i guess that's how reputations work but it's like there are general ones that are like oh celestial primates are like troublemakers they're a handful they are dangerous they're silly they're wacky they're not worth your time there's that general thing but then it's like if you spend time with them you can't help but like fall in love like they're just silly they're just silly goofballs so it's like mk is slowly in that process of developing his status as what kind of celestial primate he will be he's like the successor to the monkey king is like his first title and now it's like what will he be other than that so that's something that he has to build up over time and this is kind of his beginning of doing that in constellations is him being like okay what do i want like who am i going to be and like what am i going to like focus on and what am i going to be good at so it's like he's kind of good at all kinds of magic like he's good at celestial because he's able to you know stick get like get the get a feel of it really quickly but then he tries elemental and he gets a feel for that really quickly so it's kind of like stumping macaque in wukong because they're like that's really fast for him to be able to do like be like in the good be on the good side of the wind element already and be able to like grow a tree on the first try you know they're like huh that's that's really something and i think it's kind of like clicked in their minds that mk could be like really great 
at any type of magic he puts him his like work like puts he decides to focus on like he could just be adept at any kind of type of magic which is really unique to him because it's like there are some types of magic that wukong is not good at like he's not very well versed in cosmic he's not he doesn't know shadow at all he doesn't know death at all and he has no interest in learning death magic like the one who's like the most versatile right now is macaque and that's just because he loves magic <laughs> but like MK could be somebody who's like able to master all five pillars just because of how adept he is in the ones that they um in the ones that they've taught him so far. So they're like, huh, that is really unique. Plus him having a, his anomaly being an earthquake plus plus trees growing golden flowers or blooming golden leaves. I forgot what I said, but that's like a double whammy and they're like, that's weird. <laughs> What's that mean? What's that mean? And I meant that as like, because MK is the celestial primate of balance, he, his, can I say this? Oh, you know what? I, why do I care? Anyway, <laughs> since he's the primate of balance, he is, basically he's going to be keeping balance in all six realms. So it's like, he's making sure that everyone's Everything is proceeding as it should be. There's no like dissent or contention or like any kind of magical mishap or anything happening in any of the realms. He's supposed to make sure everything's balanced and as it should be. And that's basically what he is in charge of being. And like, what is that for the other celestial primates? Wukong's is really vague because he has so many titles and he's the monkey king. So it's like, how do you, you know? assign him a job but basically he's like protector so it's like his he is the primate of like strength and i think i said it's wisdom slash bravery so it's like he's super strong plus he's got this intuitive way of learning all types of ways to deal with people like he's able to outwit them and like come up with ideas on the fly so he's very wise in that way very street smart, I would say. Then it's like this need of protection. So he's like a very protective type of person because that's what he's been doing, you know, and he is good at it and he knows that. So it's like he has no trouble sacrificing himself. He will just run in there and just protect people. He will push people away because that's just what he's been that's just what he does. He doesn't have very much self-preservation. It's like, that's his duty. So he's like, I'm going to devote my whole self to this. So that's kind of what his job is. Macaque is the celestial primate of insight and intelligence. So it's like, he's very strategic. He's a very like, he has all sight. So he's able to like see the present, past and future. And he has super hearing. So he's able to hear all these things. So he's very like, the planner, the strategic one, the one who's like able to see how things are going to go and like potentially stop those things. So he's like the tactician who moves people and who moves like chess pieces on a board. Like he can tell people to do certain things like, oh, that's not going to work or that's stupid. Don't do that. That type of thing. Little Star is meant there since they are connection and curiosity, they embody like this inherent need to know, to learn. And also they embody the connections everybody shares, which is a power in and of itself. And we learned that in the constellations within us. So Little Star is like able to form a connection with anybody. So they're like able to get anybody to understand them and they can understand the other person. So it's how they can get people invested and bring people together that type of thing is what little star is really good at mk is being balanced is good at all these things <laughs> so you know he's just got everything going for him and you notice that each primate has like two things because it's like macaque is uh insight intelligence little star is connection and curiosity mk is balance and hope so it's like he is integral just overall he's like He's not the most important primate because they're all super important and they 
work together really well. But, you know, he's he's got a lot of... That power of hope is so strong, but it can also be like a huge burden. Because he has to protect that. And he has to keep that in all the realms, like this this feeling of hope. So it's it's, you know, that's a lot to deal with but that's like his like his I I'm, I'm feel like I'm trying to under like describe MK's like specific type of magic he's using just celestial magic he's just really good at it and it's like why and it's like mm. it's that celestial primate intelligence and wisdom to just pick up on things but MK is like since he's hope also that influences his magic because one of the key points of magic is like emotional, like the heart. Your heart can inspire the spells you cast to be greater than what they were. So it's like people believing in MK and showing hope can invigorate him and strengthen him because that's like core to his being is hope. So yeah. Um, also, I wanted, this kind of goes into that, since we're just talking about celestial primate stuff. And Macaque talked about this in the epilogue where he was like, yeah, um, one of the 10 kings of hell told me that I have all sight because I was born from water, which is present in every realm. And he was like, but every element is present in every realm. So what the fuck does that mean <laughs> for the other primates? And that was really smart and astute of him to figure out because it's like every primate has like a special power that only they can do. So it's like, Macax is all sight. What is everybody else's? That's something that will probably come up later. Um, but it's also something that he's thinking about. So that means MK has something, Lothar has something, Wukong has something. It's just that Macax tuned into his real quick. <laughs> he figured his out real quick um everybody else is just taking their time and it's not mk's fault because he was born last and it's not little star's fault because they've been mia it's wukong's fault because <laughs> what has he been doing nothing um but i'm i'm trying to figure out what other in uh what other things about mk's magic that is like that I need to talk about, but I feel like I've, you know, it's really just the embodiment of hope and him just getting that spur of this surge of magic because of that, because of being influenced by other people and their hope. He can feel that. So it's like that strengthens his magic too. Um, and I think that's it. He's really good at wood magic as he has shown. I think, I don't know what else to, to say. Um, He's beautiful, <laughs> but I don't know if you have other questions, just leave them in the comments and I'll, or send me an ask or something and I'll just add those to the next one, add the next podcast or whatever. Um, so the next question is, would Wukong be able to master shadows easily if he tried? And the answer to that is no, <laughs> he would not. I think um, it would actually be pretty difficult for him for two reasons the first reason is because um his enlightenment and his journey he's very in tune to celestial magic celestial med meditation that type of thing so switching to shadow magic would be like a big change and it would be very weird for him to like switch to that when he's already you know gone through all that through meditation and stuff or try to because that leads to my second point he has difficulty confronting the his traumas and like deeper feelings of things that is why in chapter five when macaque was like no it's really fucked up that you got burned alive in a furnace for almost 50 days and wukong was like you know what yeah you're right <laughs> it's like it took him he just doesn't think about these things as deeply because it hurts and so he's like trying to protect himself in that way so he's kind of like dismissing his own trauma, his own pain. He's like, I'm not going to think about that right now. I'm not going to think about it. And you can't make me. But then Macaque comes over, right? And this is why a really cool thing about Shadow Peach that I like a lot. Macaque creates this way 
that Wukong can't run anymore because Makak is very direct. He's going to be like, no, this is why this is, it's like this. And this is why you feel like this. This is why you feel like that. He can dissect things like that because he's just, that's how his brain works. He's very clever. He's in, because he is dealing with shadow magic. He knows how people operate. He knows how they think. He knows how they can go from one thought to the next thought. So he's like, Wukong, you are upset about this and you, you don't even see it, but I'm going to tell you that you're upset. And then you have to confront it. Like, you can't run away anymore. So it's like, since Makak has been dead, Wukong has been able to, like, push these things to the side. As soon as they're on a good enough point where they can, like, talk about these things, there's an instance where Wukong has to, like, confront some of his emotions from his punishment. And Makak started that. So it's like, it's a way of, like, them trying to be better together. Because it's like, Makak knows that if you process these things and talk about them, it's better. But it's also something he forgot because Wukong had to remind him, why don't you talk about the whole death thing <laughs> with me? And it's not and it's, it's not because, because also Makak didn't have anybody to talk to about that type of thing. Like, he can't go talk to MK about, like, what? no way is he going to do that. So it's like, Wukong is like the only person. I mean, if Little Star were around. He would talk to them, but they're not. So Wukong is there. Because, <laughs> well, Macaque wouldn't talk to Wukong about this because it's something, it's a subject that he, Wukong, is afraid of. So he would try and find somebody else to talk to about this. There was nobody else. So since, so Wukong made himself available to do that. And that's growth for him. And it's also growth for Macaque because he's like, oh, that's right talking about things does help and that's you know that's something people have to be reminded of from time to time and it's something that I have to be reminded of a fair bit (laughs) because you're like nah I'll just I don't need to talk about this it's an it's enough you know I can just keep it to myself but it's like talking about it just out loud to somebody else is can make you feel better instantly and then it's like even if you've talked about it to like two or three people you're like Oh, I still have issues with this. I still want to like vocalize that. Talking to it with other people you trust is can still be beneficial, even if you've already spoken about it. It can just help you process things. And hearing yourself, hearing words that you say, the things that you say out loud can lead to realizations that you didn't know. It's like, oh, now that I said it like that, that sounds like resentment. Or, oh, now that I said it like that, uh, it sounds like I'm still in love with this person or, you know, like it can, it can lead to those kinds of revelations where you're like, oh shit. Yeah. This really helped me figure something out or process it. And that's something that McCack need to be reminded of. And it's something Wukong needs to do. So will he do that? I don't know, but that's why he can't do, um, shadow powers. He can't do, uh, he wouldn't be able to master it. It would take a long time, a long time for him to do it. Um, so I mean, eventually, yeah, easily. Nope. And it's also something he doesn't want to do. So he's like, eh, I'll leave the shadow magic to the shadow monkey. How about that? (laughs) Um, the next question is what would happen if Macaque were to assess himself again with his shadow powers? And that's like, what would happen if Macaque had one of his rituals where he becomes more in tune with his magic because I said in chapter three of the epilogue that or Macaque said it beautifully I might add that to keep up his connection with shadow magic and you know be able to control the shadows well he has to spend like time in like a ritual of getting to know himself and reassess and uh process things like learn about his Shadow, the shadows of his heart and mind understand those things to in order to better mal- manipulate the shadows going forward so you'd have to do that you're supposed to do it regularly <laughs> like you're supposed to do it i'd say like as as an immortal being i would say at least every 20 years at least if it's been like a pretty slow 20 years maybe every 50 years but i feel like every f- 20 years is the minimum you know, because it's like things can change so much and it doesn't really take that long. If you're already like really good and versed in shadow magic, it's like, oh, okay, I need to like 
sit down and uh, reassess myself. And then you just, you know, sit down with your shadow magic and you go back and you look through the past two decades and you're like, oh, okay, that changed. I did that. Oh, that was fucked up. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, no, I have a shadow of resentment. I need to process that. It's kind of like meditation, but it's like more deliberate because it's like with meditation, you are doing something, you're looking for something, you're going back through past memories or something to find something with shadow magic. It's very past and present E because you're taking the emotions you felt in the recent past and you're like processing and going over them and being like, okay, I now understand that shadow of resentment. Now I feel more connected to myself and I feel more connected to the shadows and my heart and mind. And then I feel connected to the shadows of the world much better because I understand myself. So it's like, now I can, you know, since my heart and mind are understood and that's what makes up shadow magic, I can now practice it better. Um, so if you, if Macaque were able to do that now, it would take a while because it's like, he'd have to process everything that happened while he was dead. So his whole time in hell, his time in hell and then uh, coming back to life and everything that's happened with that and Wukong and being killed and all that, it would take like two centuries. <laughs> um, so it's something you have to do off and on. If he were to do it now, it would be difficult. He would probably spend like a couple months. I mean, if he wasn't training MK... You know, he would just take the centuries to do it. But since he's training MK, he's it's like he can't be gone for a long amount of time. Him and Wukong are used to like spending centuries doing something, you know, because they have so much time. Now they can't really do that. They have to limit, they have to shorten the thing. So it's like usually something they would do for 50 years has to be one month. You know, they really have to shorten what they're doing because they have to train MK and be present in this time. So they're like, oh, we have to rush through this <laughs> or or break it up into smaller chunks, which is what they would do. Um, so if he did it now, it would just, he'd have to break it up into smaller chunks and he, it would take a while. Um, I think there would be a period where his shadow magic would fluctuate because he's still trying to contend with things. It's, it's much easier to do it if it's in like a continuous type of thing. But that's why Macaque said if it was MK doing it, he'd have to do it like once a week because he's, you know, time is different for him so it's for macaque though he could do it it's much better if it's for a longer amount of time but since he has to be present in this time period it have to be shorter and that would lead to some fluctuation with his magic uh where it would be overly strong sometimes it'd be too weak sometimes and he'd be like oh fuck i have to sit down and do that again to make things more balanced um so yeah um Next question. Okay, do they summon the same cloud somersault each time or is it a different cloud? If it's the same cloud, do they have names for their clouds? That's really cute if they had a name for their cloud. <laughs> I know they did that in Dragon Ball. Um, I think that they don't have names for their clouds though. Because I think that they think about it bro broadly, at least Wukong does. Because like I said before, elemental spirits are like people in a choir. So it's like when they direct their, or they cast a cloud summit, if they cast a cloud somersault spell, they are directing their magic to interact with those spirits of the wind that are nearby or are listening actively. So they're like, hey spirits, I need a, I need a, um, I need a cloud, please. Thanks. And then spirits are like, who is this person? And then they're like, oh, it's it's the monkey king. Okay. And then some of them gather together and they, you know, the cloud comes. Or it's like, if it's like, if MK does it, they're like, oh, fuck. And then they're all rushing to do it because <laughs> they like MK so much. Um, so it's, it's a different cloud each time. Sometimes uh, the same spirits might be involved. Um, it depends on where they are because the spirits are in different places, 
but yeah, it, uh, it's different each time and they don't have names. I actually think MK would name his, <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. I think MK would name his and then Wukong would be like, oh shit, should I name my Cloud Somersault? But he probably wouldn't think that because he understands that the wind is made up of many different spirits. So he's like, well, I can't name just one spirit. I can't give them all one name, even though I don't think the spirits would mind. They'd be like, oh, cool. <laughs> They'd be like, nice. But MK would definitely do it because he doesn't have that understanding of how spirits work and the elements work. What would his name for the cloud be? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, probably a cute name. Fluffball. Not Fluffball. I actually think MK would name it like something silly. Like, <laughs> this is my cloud, Chad. <laughs> I don't know. He would come up with some specific name. He's like, or some name that hasn't isn't common. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Maybe you, maybe you guys can have some ideas of what his cloud name would be. I'd be interested interested to see people's different takes because that's really cute, and I think he would do that. Um, last question is: What was my favorite scene to write in Constellations Part One? Um, I guess that means just the constellations within us fic, like that whole entire fic was what was my favorite part. And I have to say chapter three, when the pavilion scene happens, when Wukong wakes up and he's like fucked up, I really, really like that scene. And I think it's because I like the way I describe the atmosphere. I think that's one of my better, um, descriptions of like painting a picture I think I did a really good job there and because I really like pavilions and I really like forests and I really like rain. So it was like, oh, these are all my favorite things happening at once. And I just like it because it's like the aftermath of a big event. So it's like, okay, now we have to talk this out. Um, uh, so I really liked that because I just like the uh, tone that was set. It was very like, oh, damn, what the fuck? What happened? You know, it's this like kind of confusion, but it's like quiet also. Like the the rain's falling and you know, it's like, it's a storm and it's like, I don't know about you guys, but when it's like raining and it's like, a, like not, not a huge thunderstorm, but like there's some thunder in the background. It's like, okay, cool. It's time to go to bed. <laughs> like, you know, it's time to curl up with the book and some tea or chocolate, hot chocolate and just vibe. So it's like this juxtaposition of something horrible just happened and it was a big deal versus the the tone of the setting of it being very peaceful and like mellow. And I, I like that type of, I just like the vibes there, I think. And it was fun to write. Like usually um, with the scenes, I'm like, oh, I have to write out of order because I don't feel like writing that. I don't feel like this. I don't feel like establishing the setting right now. I want to write about dialogue. Then I have to go back and write about setting later. That one was really easy because I just started. I was just like, oh, like, let's do the setting. We're just going to keep going. I just remember writing in, I didn't have to write in pieces. I just went beat to beat from start to finish. And that's really weird for me. <laughs> I usually write out of order and then splice it together and then read it again and edit it to make it seem like I didn't do that. So, <laughs> um, you know, we all have our processes. Um, so it's either that one or, and I really liked Wukong and MK digging in the desert. And I like that scene because it's in the first chapter. And I think that was when I was like, okay, I'm committed to this. I remember feeling that distinctly when I had them digging in the desert. I was like, this is a really good idea for this fic and I want to see it happen. I'm going to read it and I want it to be finished. And that's when that type of commitment shows and it like I think it shows itself in the scene after that where they go to the ice when they get go get ice cream and everything kind of feels a little bit more solid to me I don't know if you guys feel that but I feel like things feel a bit more like established it's like okay the prose has a confidence to it now that it didn't have before when I go back and read like the first part of constellations I feel like it's a little bit wobbly I'm like I don't know if I'm going to stick with this and I'm, I might change this. I think this is like the general idea. Um, but then as we go on, it, it gets a little bit more sturdy. 
So you're like, okay, we're sinking our teeth into it now. I like that it happened slowly over time. I've wanted to go back and edit the first chapter, but I'm like, no, this is a good, it's a good way for me to read it from start to finish and see how that changed and how my writing style changed slightly and how like once I got more confidence that showed in my writing that I can do this because I wasn't really sure I could. And being able to see that through the writing itself is really motivating. And it's just like, wow, it's something every writer goes through or every artist I feel like goes through, you know, you finish a piece and you're like, I'm not really sure about this. But then as you go on, you feel more confident drawing that person. It's like, if an, if you're an artist, you draw the same, you like, you're nervous drawing this character you've never drawn before. But then as you keep doing it, you get, you're like, oh, I remember how their eyes are or what color their fur is or whatever, their hair, their eyes, you know, that was a good example of that in written form is like how the first chapter, like gets a little bit more sturdy as time goes on. It's like, I feel like you can see my commitment happening over time. And then you go to chapter two and it's like, oh shit, we're starting. It is happening and it feels real. And it feels like we are in here for the long haul and it's going to be a fun time. And then chapter three happens and then your heart breaks. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess it happens at the end of chapter two and in chapter two, your heart breaks and you're like, fuck. Then you go into chapter three and you're like, okay, I've cobbled myself together. We've had a few, we've had a few little tentative laughs Maybe it'll get better. And then it's like, fuck, no, it got worse. Then you, then, then you go into chapter four and you're like, MK and Wukong made up. We can do it. We can do it. Then MK gets kidnapped and then the mirror scene happens and then you're just a blob on the floor and you're like, fuck, I can't, I can't keep doing this. But then you keep doing it. And then chapter five is like, okay, everything's good. Everything's good. We were doing good, and then that scene in the alley happens. <laughs> you see the pattern. I like I like making things feel like they're okay. Everything's on. Everybody's on good terms. We're feeling good, feeling confident. Never mind. Here's some feelings and some angst out of nowhere. I think that's so funny, but it's also like I don't do that intentionally. I literally just do what feels correct or what the characters want to do because that whole alleyway scene in chapter five was not planned that was not supposed to happen so people being like you did this on purpose no i fucking didn't that was like two thousand words that came out of nowhere i was pissed when that happened i was like fuck i don't have time for this because the chapter was almost over i was like are you fucking kidding me now i have to write two thousand words because these monkeys have to talk this is bullshit i'm still mad but I still like that scene, so <laughs> it all worked out. Okay, so my favorite scene, sorry, this is taking a long time to answer. The pavilion scene, it, we're calling it MK in the desert, and I love the farm scene. <gasps> I love it. I loved writing about the farm. I loved writing about Wukong putting those fucking seeds in the water, in the dirt. It was, it was so much fun. I don't know why. <laughs> I know why, because I had a specific, I could visualize that part so well. Like I had the whole thing, I could see it. And I was like, oh, this is, this is nice. Plus I just like rice terraces. I, I love rice terraces. And every time I like see a show or I play a video game where there's a fucking rice terrace, I'm like, wow, I'm never moving from this spot. <laughs> Or I'm just going to stay on this scene. I'm not moving. I love them so much. I like how they're terraced. And they are rice fields. <laughs> <laughs> and I also just like terraces in general, you know. Um, with If they're flowers or they're just water. I don't know. I just like that type of... I just like that land form. I don't know what it's called. I think it's really, really pretty. It's beautiful. Yeah, so I liked doing that, and I just liked um, writing Wukong doing manual labor, and him and MK working together, and then Macaac just interjecting with his sunglasses on. I like that whole scene, and I like the argument that happened as a result of that, and I like the morning after. I just like that, that whole lead up. 
so good. Honestly, I should just go through and like reread Constellations while recording myself because there's like so much insight that I forgot about and it would be good to refresh my brain. But um, since we're here, so the epilogue, uh, I think as I said previously, it was supposed to be from Wukong's perspective. Initially, it was going to be. Then I changed it to Macaques because I was like, that's too much of a Wukong's perspective, actually. I think we should change it. So I did that. <laughs> then, um, as I started seriously working on it, I was like, this is going to be way too long. And so it had to, it had to become its own fic. It was supposed to be chapter seven of Constellations. It was just going to be like a quick thing. Now that I'm working on it, I was like, that was really, really stupid of me to even say. But I really didn't understand how much Macaque would have to say and how much these things would affect him. Like how all these subjects being talked about would affect his introspection. Because I hadn't written in his perspective before, but now that I've gotten used to it, I'm like, oh yeah, there was no way. Um, but it was supposed to be like 40,000 words and I was like that's super long, but I was like, I can justify putting 40,000 words into a chapter because I've done that before and it's annoying, but I'm like, well, I don't want to have like 10 chapters added on to constellations. So, but I think once I got to 50,000 words in the epilogue or some ridiculous amount, I was like, okay, we need to just, we need to um, make it its own thing. So that's what we decided to do. I say we, that's what I decided to do. Um, so yeah, now it is going to be 16 chapters. It might be 15 because I don't know how to do math. And one part of it was actually, two parts of it were supposed to be, are connected. So they're one part. And I looked at that the other day. I was like, oh fuck, maybe it's 15. I don't know. I think it is going to be 15 because I, I don't think I should separate those things. But yeah, yep, 15 parts. So for the epilogue, it has expanded to be something I never thought it would be. There is a lot going on in each one of these chapters. And I like how fleshed out it feels, how like it's not rushed. I think that's how it was going to be. If I stuck it at the end of Constellations, it would be very snippet-like instead of like fully fleshed out chapters. It would be like drabbles kind of instead of what we have now. And I like this a lot better because it allows us to have more time with Macaque. And I think it's funny that Macaque wants to have as much screen time as Wukong. I think that's petty and just like in character for him. But um, I know I really want to talk about the differences between Macaques and Wukong's perspective and things that people might not have picked up on or like, you know, they, they read it and they don't like, maybe it's like harder to process. I don't know. It's, it's really hard for me to tell what people process as a reader because I'm also a writer. So it's like when I read novels that are just out, I say things and critique things that other people don't think about. Like I was just reading a novel and I was talking to somebody, a work friend, and I was like, I actually don't really like the pacing of this and the prose is kind of boring at times and the perspective is not really interesting and there's not enough characters for us to like attach there's not enough attachment with the characters they're not they're not making me care enough and the interactions between the characters are so stilted that it's hard to make that to establish that connection so we either need like a shake-up or we need like more characters not too many we need more characters or we need more interesting dialogue and they were just like looking at me like um yeah i i don't i just like that they kissed or whatever you know <laughs> so i was like oh geez <laughs> you know it's hard to like not saying that everybody's like this, but it's just like what I, since I'm a writer, I'm looking at, I'm not just looking at the plot. I'm looking at the sentence structure and all the uh, literary devices and all the uh, craft. I'm looking at the craft of writing. I'm not just looking at the words. Not that that's what other readers do. I'm just like looking at it from a more technical standpoint. I didn't mean to like make anybody feel like, oh, what you're doing is not really serious. No, what you're doing is, is important. It's just hard for me to like take the writer side of myself out and just be a reader. So it's, I feel like I have to explain things to people who are just readers or you are also writers and you are 
reading this and dissecting my craft. So, I mean, that's fine. <laughs> so, but if you have been dissecting my craft, then you know that Wukong in Macaque's perspective is very different. Wukong, when you go from Constellations, chapter five or six, whatever the fuck, and you click that button to go to epilogue, I feel like there's this just, there's the, I feel like there's this like big, like what the fuck kind of moment. Like, oh, there's been a huge change because Macaque starts out really strongly. Like, first, it has that whole, it's the completion of Wukong's vow. Then it, like, goes into how, it goes into a overview of Makek's whole, his broad viewpoint as a resurrected primate and, like, what he's thinking. And it's just very technical. It is very, like, it, it feels very theatrical to me. It feels like the opening to some kind of like monologue, like an opening monologue to a play. It's like, so this is this character and this is what's going on in this setting. It's very like Macaac being like, okay, here's what's going on. Here's my thought process. Here's where I am now. It is very establishing. And that's not what Wukong would do. Like, I like how when you go back to Constellations, it's like Wukong is just like, so anyway, I was sleeping and then I got woken up <laughs> by a star and it's just, it's, Wukong is just immediate like action. It is like dialogue. He doesn't have time to ruminate too much, which goes into character for him because he does not ruminate on things very long. He does not think about things that hurt him. He is like in the moment, very in the moment. And he, while being in the moment, he notices like, settings and, and and scenery and things and he'll point out the seasons and how everything feels and paint this pretty picture of the sunset and the dawn and in the night sky and all that he will do that because he's learned to appreciate the beauty and things because his master told him to and that's one of the things he's taken away from the journey so he will paint those pretty pictures macaque is a little he's not gonna do that as much i think instead of painting a picture macaque describes how the weather affects him and others um, let me find an example of this. Okay, so I am I want to find an example of this. One of it, I'm looking at like chapter six of the blog where how it just starts. And there's like two sentences about um, like the uh, the setting, like the, the scenery or the uh, feeling of summer. And it's it's hot or whatever. And it's this, it's the summer season or whatever. And then it's like immediately into like, anyway, here's what's been going on with me. Wukong would just take more time with that. He'd be like, and the sun was like, uh, wow, I can't do this live. The sun was like saturated with oranges and reds and the sky was uh, painted with all these an ombre of color or some crap, a gradient of color or some crap like that. He would like go in and describe all the different colors. Macaque is more like, okay, here's, here's how it felt. And this is what's happening. So Wukong spends more time on painting this picture of the setting. And then he'll go to the action. And then Macaque is like, he's, Macaque is more introspective. He is like talking about his own feelings. He's talking about like the process of things He's talking about all that. Wukong is like, I will talk about the setting. And I might talk about my feelings a little bit. And I might be observant, but I'm mostly going to be talking about the setting and then like how I'm feeling. And then we're going to go right to the action. Like it's, 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 it's that change of it. And then it's like, um, even down to the sentence structure, I think you can notice the change between Macaque and Wukong. I feel like Macaque's, even Macaque's word choice is different. He uses a lot of words that Wukong doesn't, and he his sentence structure is different when he um, talks about things. I think Macaque has a, his introspection is a lot more. It has this tone of like seriousness, like it's like, okay, we're with Macaque now. We have to like straighten up and pay attention. You know, it's like he's gonna point out things and 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 notice things and and it's serious whereas with Wukong it's like okay we're just here to have a good time 
and it's a pretty day and we're going to have fun and we're going to laugh, you know, and we're going to do all this. That's why I did that poll of like, which perspective do you like reading more Wukong's or Macaques? And it was pretty even, but Wukong won by a little bit. And I was like, well, that makes sense because Wukong's perspective is like a little bit more lighthearted and it's lighthearted because he's not really thinking about his internal trauma, but like, he's also just like taking this positive spin on things. He's like, all right, you know, we're going through it. We're having a good day. We're, we're focusing on the positive things. And, and I feel like you can see even in, in some of the instances and in constellations where Wukong's like, oh, that really sucked. And it was sucky. And I feel bad about that. But the sky is pretty and the sun's shining. So we can, <laughs> you know, it's, it's that kind of change. Like Macaque is like evenly serious and evenly it has this kind of like depressive tone to it. Not depressive. Well, yeah, it is depressive because he's depressed, but like, he's like saddened. It's saddened throughout melancholy. It's melancholy because it's so serious. And then when he has moments of like happiness, I think it, you notice it because it's like the, the pros and introspection is a lot more like, oh, there's a little bit of lightheartedness to it. It feels a little bit more whimsical. It's, it's pretty. Um, so I like those changes in their perspective in in writing them it's very it's very different i think if i had to go back to writing wukong i had to have like an adjustment period like holy shit okay wait i have to get my mindset i have to get my mindset together <laughs> for writing wukong um what else did i want to say about the epilogue um just that i'm having fun with it and i wanted to like talk about how people are like Oh, they still haven't kissed. You know, I, just, I guess I just want to say that they're not going to kiss in the epilogue. I mean, it's not planned for them to, but I'm also not an idiot. And I know that anything can happen. So maybe they will. I don't know. It's not planned for them to. Um, I think and I think this is where it it's it's like where Constellations is very niche. Like, I'm honestly surprised Constellation has the amount of hits or whatever or kudos that it has because I'm like, oh, everybody wants to see their their OTP, like, kiss or hold hands and be lovey-dovey together. Some people want angst, but that number is generally smaller than the people who want fluff. So I was like, okay, well, this is kind of like working on relationships and interpersonal relationships in that whole dynamic. It's not, it's mostly angst, but there's a few small moments of fluff, but it's not too much you know it's not really till chapter four that the fluff happens and it's just because they're talking their shit out so I was like this is not gonna resonate with a lot of people because it's not exactly what they want but seeing the amount of people who are like oh yeah this is this feels right um that makes me feel a little bit better because I didn't write this with the intention of being like fluff I'm like there's plenty of other people who are writing that that you can go see you know I wanted to write a more realistic depiction of a shadow peach race relationship and how long it would take for that to get even on an okayish level. And I wanted them to be former mates so that it, I can have like that foundation because I think that they were, and that's just what I want. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, people wanting fluff are not wrong. It's just like, I don't think I'm going to be able to give that to you right now. And it's also like a fun, a, like a fundamental difference with me as a person, as a writer who's writing this stuff. To me, I'm like, yes, I want established relationship in fluff. Everybody, I mean, not everybody does, but a lot of people do. Um, But more important to me, even than that, is just a realistic relationship. Because that's satisfying to me. It is satisfying to have like, oh man, there were there were they had to go on fifteen walks to even get to get to this point. That's amazing. I like how slow this is. I like how it's not rushed. I like how it's like, no, we're gonna take our time and we're gonna work on this bit by bit. Because that was the whole thing. That was the whole point. They said, they said they agreed to work on this together, and that's what the epilogue is. It is them working on it together. And that's the good and the bad. It's progress. And progress is not always like straightforward. It's like you have to go back sometimes or somebody slips up. I wanted that kind of like transparency in this fic. I wanted it to be like more realistic. So it is like a slow burn, I guess. 
Um, but it's not even like a traditional slow burn. In a traditional, I guess, I don't really read too many slow burns because I'm impatient, which is funny because how did I write this and why am I doing this to myself? But anyway, I do not read too many slow burns uh, because I like established relationship a lot. But even in those slow burns that you see on these fix and stuff, it'll be like a hundred thousand words and then they get together a hundred thousand words and they're together constellations is like a hundred and sixty thousand words and they're still not together and the epilogue is like what sixty thousand right now and they're still not together <laughs> like like we're at two hundred thousand i don't know math and they're still not together so i'm like this is like an this is like a uh super slow burn and I don't even like slow burn I don't know why but anyway it's just it's I I get that that's frustrating because it's like we invested all this time into it into reading it you know what is going on and it's like I have to put that in the context of even though Constellations is so long we had a lot of other stuff going on we had a whole plot where we had to go get lantern pieces we had to get those together we had to do some fights we had to do some flying we had to do some mk conversations we had a mystery we had mysteries to unpack we had all these other things so it's like it's not that was not the only plot there were multiple plots happening so that's so we can't do it you know just based on word count because and we shouldn't because it's like every fic, fic is unique some people just have that central plot of these two characters are going to fall in love other fics have like multiple plots some of them have two you know it, it, it changes but since there's so much going on in constellations, it's hard to do it or quantify or calculate it through just word count. It's like there's too many things going on. But now, but the epilogue is like this more honed in type of fic where it's like, okay, now it's just the two of them. And then every time they meet up over these months, how their relationship is changing over time and how they are getting comfortable with each other and how they're talking things out um so I, I mean it's it's the end goal the end goal with this is more like having a foundation for shadow peach to bounce off of or like build off of we're rebuilding the foundation so that they can go on to do things together in a more believable way and that takes time because they were they were hurt in a really bad way it's like the hurt that is in this au is is very deep and real so to fix that it takes time and i don't want to rush that i think it's more satisfying when it's like i can see when you can go back and you can be like, I can see every instance of, of trust being given. I can see how the slow, how Macaac slowly warmed up and how Wukong slowly opened up. And you can see like the changes in their behavior and how they talk to each other. It's like, God, just, just even now, if I look at chapter one versus chapter seven, where it's like, they were more hesitant to touch each other and just, um, talk about some things and Macaac had this like Macaac was just like still making Wukong feel bad by blame like bringing up his death and stuff at every opportunity he could versus chapter seven where he's willingly going to apologize to him for saying something he shouldn't have said and he knows was wrong and was very untrue <laughs> which is funny as fuck to me how do you fuck up that bad but you know it's it's that change because he wouldn't have done that in the first chapter but in the seventh chapter, because of all the walks they've gone on, he is invested in this. So he's like, yeah, I need to go apologize because we've already put in all this work to this. I've already sunk in all this time. And it's like, also with this epilogue, it's like you can see Macaque seeing the value of a relationship with Wukong while also knowing the dangers of a relationship with Wukong. It is that just a position that the epilogue is like really based is like built on and that's why it had to be in macaque's perspective so we could be on that journey with him and we see like even in every chapter it's like oh do i want to kill wukong i don't know 
Do I want to kill him? Maybe yes. No. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, we see this back and forth. I feel like it's really frustrating as a reader to be like, oh, is he going to do it? Why can't he just decide? It's like he can't. Every time he comes over to this freaking mountain, he's like, okay, I'm willing to work on this. And then Wukong will say something. He's like, fuck, I should have killed him when I had the chance. Then Wukong will apologize for what he said. And he's like, oh, I guess I shouldn't have killed him. Like you see, like it's, he, it's, and it's also just knowing that Wukong is just this important person. That he, he, Wukong knows him so well. How do you kill somebody who knows you that well? Who knows you inside and out? How can you kill somebody like that? Even if they hurt you deeply and did the worst thing, you would be reluctant to let go of that connection because it's like, <laughs> am I ever going to find anybody else like that? Plus it's like, do you still have feelings for him? It's like, it's complicated, you know? And it's like, they're hanging out so much. Maybe they're falling in love all over again. It's like they're, cause they're, they're learning these new versions of themselves. So it's like you talk about different things and see different quirks and stuff in the changes from how somebody used to be. And you're like, oh, I see. I see how you've changed. I don't really mind it. <laughs> that type of thing. Like, I think there's been a lot of instances where Macaque has been pleasantly surprised by stuff that Wukong has done. Like Wukong offering to listen to his talk about death or Wukong like giving Macaque his cape back after fixing it and then being like, you know what? I appreciate you trying to do this. But if you don't want to do it anymore, I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to force you. That is your choice. And we were going to do whatever you think is best. And Wukong just walking away and not throwing a fit and not getting mad and not like clinging on to Macaque and pestering him to keep doing it. He's like, no, he's respectful and he's doing his best. He's still slipping up. They're both slipping up. But it's a great way to show through Macaque's eyes how Wukong has changed. And I think that's like super interesting. It's those little things that are interesting to me that I'm like, oh, I can do without a kiss or a hug or, or they did hug and they have, they have held hands. They just haven't kissed, but it's like, I can do without that because I'm seeing how Wukong has changed through Macaque's eyes. I'm picking up on all these little details of like Macaque giving Wukong trust over time. And stuff like that. I think like those are fun to pick up on to me and to sneak in here. Um, I think those are super interesting to write about and also just to read about. And it's just like how do you, how you like uh, how a friendship like gradually changes. Like it's like they've done the whole I fucked up. Here's an apology. They've talked about hard topics. Now it's like what other things are friendship what other things make up friendship? You know, is it like venting frustrations? Is it um, hanging out casually, like even more casual than walking, doing other things, uh, playing tag, doing things like that? It's like just how their friendship is developing is interesting to me, just in the little nuances of it. And I mean, I said like Macaque having this like, Will I, won't I, I don't know, type of back and forth is just difficult. He's having a hard time with it because, you know, there's, and I think chapter six is just like really on the nose, maybe not too on the nose, but like when they're like in that fucking bamboo forest <laughs> and they crash down and Wukong is like told Macaque that he misses him there was this moment for Macaque to be like oh okay that type of thing where he like has this moment of vulnerability and understanding and just like pushing all the like resentment and anger and hatred aside just to look at Wukong as a person and just like forget all that other stuff for a second for a second forget all those things and then what he saw when he pushed all those things to the side was love that is heartbreaking and I think that's just really tragic and sad and it's it's that's what I that's that's what motivated me to write this AU in the first place it's the inherent tragedy of being in love with somebody who killed you 
or who hurt you super deeply. And you're like, but I don't want to let go of this person because I love them and they know me better than anybody else. Like I, it's, it's that type of Shakespearean tragedy <laughs> that draws me in. I'm like, oh hell, what are you going to do? You know, it's like, you follow along with macaque and you're like, I understand how you feel and how you're hesitant and how you do want to go back with this. Per like you can understand from his perspective either way, even if he did go and kill Wukong, you're like, okay, that's fair. He killed you. Or even if he's like, oh, I want to be together with him. It's like, okay, that was your mate. Of course you want to be back with him. That's your one and only, you know? So it's like you can understand either like either way, like both perspectives. I think that's super important. And I think that chapter six is just like crucial for many reasons, just like for Shadow Peach and MK, because hello, he just grew a tree. But like <laughs> I think that's I think the timing of chapter six and because it's also like my favorite chapter so far. Um, but not for long. <laughs> um, but like just how, gosh, just that moment in the bamboo forest is just so sad. It's so pretty and romantic and beautiful, but it's just like, oh, that's terrible. That's so sad. And then you just go to the next chapter and then he just insults Wukong unintentionally. <laughs> it's just like, and, and, and I wrote that like to give more credence to the whole attraction thing because the whole thing on the farm with Wukong I mean with Macaque wearing sunglasses was him like trying to be subtle and Wukong didn't pick up on it because he was working first of all but then he's like I'm not gonna look at Macaque's dumbass and then Macaque is just eyeing him like eye candy it's just so fucking funny and it's funny that like anytime it, like as soon as he sees <laughs> Wukong shirtless he's like oh I cannot function <laughs> He like shuts down. He's like, I can't think. It's so funny to me when like really smart strategic people who are like always thinking, always know what to do, that type of shit, just blue screen when the object of their affection is just like there. And it's super funny to me that all it takes is Wukong taking his shirt off and Macaque's like, <gasps> like <laughs> cannot, <laughs> cannot focus. It is so funny. And I also like that weakness of him because I think that like makes him more relatable and like humanizes him and like adds a layer of uh, character depth because it's like he's like, I still am attracted to this idiot and he's mad at himself for being attracted to him. And so he just channels that anger indirectly and incorrectly towards Wukong. And then when he figures out that he upset him, he's like, oh, shit. It is so funny that he just had to go and apologize. And that Wukong was like instantly cheered up when Macaque explained why he said that. Because it's like Macaque is not going to be 100% direct when it comes to apologies. He's not going to do that. He's got to save face. He's not going to be like, I'm sorry, because I thought you were cute with your little tum-tum and your little patch of fur and you looked really squeezable and huggable and I couldn't like handle all those emotions at once. So I said something mean and I didn't mean it. He's like, no, you were just distracting me. And then Wukong has to then take that apology and dissect it, which he knows to do from past experiences. Like he knows Macaque is not going to 100% be uh, honest when it comes to apolog apologizing. He's kind of like, it's wild that Macaque is apologizing at all. Wukong's like, holy shit. <laughs> but then he's like, oh, distraction. Okay. Oh, distraction. Okay. That's why he like got down and was giggling because he understands what that means. He's like, oh, okay. So it was attraction. Okay. That's cool. And then he gets really excited because now he has confirmation that Macaque is like attracted to him. And then like, cause he wasn't even thinking about that or like entertaining that thought. Wukong was like, I don't even, I'm not even going to think about that. Cause like, <laughs> cause this is the thing with the epilogue and it's so funny cause we're not in Wukong's perspective. Wukong is just happy that Macaque's like coming over, like that they're even talking. He is so happy with like the bare minimum. 
And of course he wants more. Of course he like is eager and greedy for more. So when he gets more, he's like super giddy. That's like when they hugged and Wukong's tail was just going crazy. It's like he never thought they would hug again. So every instance of like trust and like connection and physical contact is just a bonus for Wukong. So his reactions are going to be very loud and, and, and elaborate, like very bright. Like you will just be wagging that tail and he will just be smiling and super happy and giggly and stupid. <laughs> Wukong just has to deal with that. Um, but he is like super happy Macaque's even coming. So all this stuff is like a bonus. So being told to his face that he was attractive is like super exciting for Wukong watch, which is why he was acting like a fucking blushing teenager about it. And, um, that's just going to be apparent going forward. That's really funny. Um, just what is going to happen because like chapter nine is ridiculous with how um well i will just say this chapter nine is like oh i can't say that oh oh well here's what i can say i think chapter nine is like a good point in the fic where it's like oh they've come far it's like i i'm surprised this is happening this happening is a big deal and it's like that it cannot be more apparent than in chapter nine where it's like a very something that you would not think would happen that they would do you're like surprised you're like what <laughs> and it's not like a big retreat like a big thing it's just like wow it's a simple thing that is commonplace for uh like it's a common thing but it's a big deal that they're doing it together um, and I, th and I think that's a real, it's a crucial turning point because here, the thing is with, as we keep going with the epilogue is we are there, Shadow Peach are getting closer together as friends and building that foundation. But as they're doing that, it's easy for somebody to say something or do something that causes a big change or is super upsetting you know because they're building this and it's like when you make a friend and you know that friend better you know how to make them upset you know what to say or what to do to upset them and then it's like if you intend to hurt or if you speak out in anger it can have this really bad effect that you didn't then have to deal with the uh the consequences of so it's like as they get closer they are able to hurt each other worse so it's like oh no you know so it's like um and repairing that takes time it's like those but it's also indicative of just how friendship is i'm not saying like friendship is like you get close and then you just attack each other i'm like no as you get to know somebody more and more you know what upsets them you know what ticks them off you know what gets under their skin so it's like if you really want to like if they say something mean to you because of a misunderstanding or something, then you're like, oh, I know exactly what to say to them to piss them off for a while. Then you say it. And then it's like, oh, shit, I shouldn't have said that. That was mean. I know it was mean and I know it was wrong. It's that kind of thing. And that's something that's been present in Shadow Peach overall because because of that, how they were former mates. So they have this like past understanding of what they valued and what ticked them off. And that some of that still carries over today. So it's like they still have that like past knowledge and that's how they like all throughout constellations how macaque could like get onto wukong and make him comfortable like upset him he could do all these things that's how he was able to because they were so close and now that they're getting close again it's like okay now that we've both changed and we're in this new level of understanding how can i upset you now at that it's that kind of thing um, but that's not to say that the rest of the vlog is just really downtrodden and it's sad. I mean, there's going to be some uh, moments of fighting because it is Shadow Peach. Let's not fucking forget. But it's, I, I mean, overall, there's a lot of growth that's happening or is going to happen that is interesting to read and fun to read. Um, and I'm mostly looking forward to when you get to the end of this 
when the epilogue is finished and you can like see you can chart the course of how they slowly came to be as they are by the end of it um and it's it's difficult to talk about at length because it's like I am so far ahead so it's like I have to rewind my brain and be like oh yeah this is where we are (laughs) I'm like huh we're not on chapter 14 what the fuck so um but just how this will set the foundation for things to come. I guess that's a good segue to go into like, after the epilogue, there are two things that I have planned to individual fix. One of them is planned. The next one after the epilogue is planned to be two chapters. That one is like the actual sequel to Constellations because the epilogue, remember, is supposed to be part of Constellations, but it wasn't because it was too long. I know this is confusing. But I guess it's like the next part. It's after the epilogue. I don't know. The next part in the series. I don't know. what. Whatever you want to say. I don't know. But that's meant to be two chapters. Then after that, there's going to be another thing. And I don't know how long that's going to be. But I have like the basic plan. I've already started writing it. So, um, but the thing is, is I don't know when those two things are going to happen. Because I've just, I've got other things to do in other fandoms. And it's kind of like, I kind of need a break from this not in a mean way but it's like good to like write different things I mean come on I mean every time I'm like oh I can't I should I should uh I beat myself up about it but then I remember that I wrote constellations in like 10 months and then I'm like oh never mind that was under a year and it is 160,000 words um so I mean it's not like I haven't given a lot And the two things that I'm thinking of, I think it would be best to just wait on those a little bit. The the epilogue will end on a satisfying note. So it's like, you're not really waiting for too much. It won't be completely satisfying. Um, Not completely. I was trying to figure out if I should say that. I don't, is that like a bad, is that a spoiler? I mean, it's a spoiler, but it's not. I think I should say it. Macaque's curse isn't going to like be fixed in the epilogue. Um, which is why those two additional things have to happen. Um, but the epilogue does not end in a way that it's like, oh, you kept us waiting. I mean, I'm going to keep you waiting because there's too many things fucking going on. I can't address everything. And this part, this epilogue, even though it probably feels like this is taking too long. It's just about Shadow Peach. It's not, they're not even kissing or or all those things. These, the things that happen in this epilogue are foundational to, we can't go anywhere unless this happens. That's what I should say. If we went from the end of Constellations to the third part in the series, it would make no fucking sense. It'd be like, wait, you would like stop and be like, did I skip a book? How did we get here? So that's why the epilogue is important. It's showing this journey that needs to happen or I can't, like, if the epilogue was not here, I couldn't write the next part. Even though nothing plot, like, super plot relevant is happening, like, nothing is, nothing, like, plot related to MK's origins or, like, the curse or anything like that is happening in this epilogue. But I still can't get there without it. Like, it has to exist. And it's like, why? And it's like, because... Because it's not just about plot. It's about interpersonal relationships and it's about the connections that they have with each other because those connections fuel the plot. The, The connections and how they change and deepen inspire characters to make decisions that can fuel the plot to go into the direction it needs to go. And so since the epilogue is crucial in that way, in deepening a connection or severing it or whatever the fuck we can't go anywhere unless that's taken care of so it's like no there's not any kissing or whatever but it's like if it wasn't here everyone would be unsatisfied you'd be like this sucks i <laughs> i get i get fluff for a little bit perhaps but it doesn't it doesn't feel earned it doesn't feel real it doesn't feel like satisfying 
And I, I don't know about you, but I want my fluff to feel earned and satisfying. I don't want to be like, because, oh, I don't, come on. If we're all being real here, you've read a fake where you're like, oh, they fought, they fought and, and they're fighting and they're still upset about each other. And then in the next chapter, they're kissing and you're like, oh, already? <laughs> you're like, oh, I wanted, I wanted a little bit more time between those things. I didn't want them to fight one chapter and then in the next one, it's, they're already made up. Like that's not satisfying. And then your brain is like, something's missing or I need to fix this or the pacing is wrong. Like your brain will try and fix it retroactively to be like, how can this, what are we missing here between this whole fighting and then kissing in the next chapter? What could be spliced there? And that is what the epilogue is for. So I, I feel like I'm like overly explaining why it's here. I know the majority of people understand why, but it's just like people, every single chapter, <laughs> People are like, oh, I hope they kiss soon or something like that. They don't mean it maliciously. They're just like, oh, I hope it happens. And I'm like, oh, oh, you, <laughs> you know, and I, they're not wrong. They're allowed to feel how they feel. And, you know, it's been a long time and normally you would have had a kiss by now, but it's just like, it's for me. This is for me first and foremost. And I swear to God, I would be so fucking mad if there was not like an epilogue-esque thing. If it went from just like one point to the next and there was no like in between, I would be so mad. I'd be pissed off. So I have to, that's why it's here. And also it's fun. I'm having fun. I don't know about you guys. I'm having fun. Like chapter seven is fucking hilarious to me. And I loved writing that chapter. It was so much fun just writing Macaque in these situations. I sure do love putting Macaque in situations where he's uncomfortable. <laughs> it's so fun. Plus, I'm like, we are seeing all these mountain monkeys. Is nobody else having fun just like talking to these fucking monkeys? I love talking to the flower fruit mountain monkeys. I love it so much. Xiao Ping is my best friend. I love him. He's going to come back. Xiaoping has to come back. And when he comes back, everyone's going to be like, oh, we love Xiaoping. Oh, Xiaoping already came back. He was in the last one, but not for long. He just had a cameo. Proud of him. But I'm like, I like making all the monkeys. And I don't know about anybody else, but I love it when the monkeys are like, oh, macaque, you're coming back. And they're like overly familiar. And they're like, prince. And they're like, come back. We miss you. And macaque's just still like, Oh, everyone forgot about me. <laughs> he has all these monkeys like begging him. It's not on, like not the whole mountain, but you know, a good chunk of the monkeys are like, come back. We miss you. Come back. And then he's like, oh, this isn't my home anymore. <laughs> he has all these people that are like, no, we literally want you to come back. Like we're waiting for you. I think that's so funny. Plus, it's just, it's, I like the callbacks to how Wukong and Macaque ruled in the past and how that would work. I like um, showing that through flashbacks or like just thoughts like this is what happened when we were together before, but this is how it is now. It's, it, that happens a lot, but that's just how Macaque thinks. He compares things in that way. And I just like um, showing just the differences between how things were then and how they are now. And... It's just fun developing the mountain current, like how it is currently now, because there's all these, there's my, many more monkeys. There's a lot of monkeys and apes on that damn mountain. And it's like Wukong has a lot to know. He has a lot of names. He has a lot of birthdays. There's a lot to manage on his own. And he's like doing his best, but he's had to like cut a few things and uh, cut some corners and like try and manage this just on his own because it's like you know with the like the elders are a good example it's like he has to go talk to them about everything and he has and he only does that sometimes he still hasn't shown introduced mk to them and it's like what is he waiting on it's kind of like um he's waiting to tell mk that he's a celestial primate and since uh macaque told him he can't tell him till they know wukong's hands are kind of tied because the um elders will be able to sense that he is a celestial primate or like it'll be apparent once they see 
Wukong and MK standing together or like side by side. It's like, huh, their energy is kind of the same. If they saw MK fight, they'd be like, huh? <laughs> they'd be like, isn't he, isn't he, what the, hold on a second. Like, I feel like they'd be able to deduce it. So it's like, you know, and some of the monkeys have seen MK fight, but it's thankfully been some of the younger ones. The younger ones have met MK because he, um, MK doesn't go over to the elders, like Grove, where they hang out because he doesn't know about them, but he hangs out at Wukong's hut and he travels up the mountain. So the little ones that can travel and move easier see MK like coming over to train and stuff. And they're like, oh, it's little sky. Like Wukong would be like, oh, you know, this is, um, you know, this is my successor. And they'd be like, oh, okay. They don't know what that means. <laughs> They're like okay what is they're like oh this is like your your um student your pupil okay and then they're just like cool and then they're like what they just swarm him with like questions and they want to play with his phone and they want to play video games and watch tv they're like really laid back they don't see like like the ones that were born recently like in the past 500 years or a thousand years they don't see the danger or like the past they don't see how necessary MK is as like a successor. They're like, they're so easygoing. They're like, oh, you just took on a student just cause, all right. And then they just hang out with MK and groom him and steal his jacket and phone. <laughs> and then MK has to run around the mountain and get his phone back. And Wukong does not help him in this. Wukong would just be like, this is extra training. And MK's like, what do you mean? <laughs> they have my phone. <laughs> and Wukong's like, ah, whatever. You can get another one. <laughs> MK's like, on my salary? <laughs> like, I do not make enough money for that. But that is like their dynamic. Like, they, they just hang out with MK. And it's really casual. MK can't speak monkey. So when the monkeys do, like, go around and play with him, he has no idea what they're saying to him. So it's kind of just like monkey gibberish. Um, the thing is, is that when I kind of hint to this, when Wukong is actually talking to monkeys or when Macaque is talking to the monkeys, they'll switch their speech. And that's like a subtle way of saying they are not speaking like the common human moral tongue, which is to say that they are not speaking like, like because Wukong and Macaque can speak many languages. So they are switching their tongue into the correct one for the person they're talking to so the monkeys have their own distinct language that mk is not privy to and does not know and the monkeys do consider him to be like a mortal just wukong's mortal student who has who's good at magic type of feeling and the young ones don't really answer ask I mean they don't really ask too many questions but the elders are like when are we gonna meet him type of deal and kind of like every time Wukong comes over there it's like oh well what about your successor when are we gonna meet him it's kind of like when you go and see family and your family's like well when are you gonna you know settle down or buy a house or you know they pester you about like when are you gonna get a partner or something like that it's kind of like that it's like well when are we gonna meet your successor I mean you've been talking about him and and then the whole thing with like macaque is now becoming another thing of that another instance of that like oh we still haven't met your successor you like why is the prince hanging around is he coming is he going to come back and it's like macaque kind of set that straight that he's not coming back so now everyone's kind of confused like why is he around then <laughs> it's just a lot of confusion but wukong does have things that he needs to tell the elders about and i just wanted to be clear that whenever MK's on the mountain and with the monkeys. He is just going off of vibes and they're just playing around with him. He just sees them as like really sweet, chill monkeys that get his vibes. And that's because, you know, MK is a celestial primate. He just does not look like one and he can't speak their language. And there's reasons for that. And that will come up later on. Um, I forgot what we were talking about. But it's like fun to like give all the monkeys names and describe what kind of monkeys they are or apes. It's fun to like figure out 
their personalities, even though I don't have time to like flesh out all these personalities. That's why I'm like Xiaoping is important because I have enough time to flesh out maybe one or two of them, you know, at three. I think I did the elders as best I could with six of them or seven of them being there. Um, so, it, and I don't want to introduce too many characters at once, but when you're on a freaking mountain and there's monkeys everywhere, you know, it's hard. And Macaque knows some of the monkeys, so it's like he has this familiarity with them. And I think it's really, like, I really love that one where he's like, telling them not to call him a prince and like oh you don't have to be so formal with me whenever that happened I forget the chapter but I like those types of moments where he's like no I'm just I'm just you know macaque now but I like that they still show him respect even though he doesn't like he's not like formally we call him his mate even though they're technically still together that is why when uh, in the end of Constellations when the Jade Emperor is reading like he they, he said Macaque is the recognized consort of Wukong they are still mates in um, like officially like they, they, they are recognized as mates because they had their mate day and whatever and so they are recognized by both it's like by in all realms they recognize as mates. I don't know if I decided to do that. I think when Wukong did that, he had to go and like note it. He had to be like, okay, I'm married <laughs> kind of thing in the celestial realm because um, I, th I don't think he put it on his record because he didn't know his record was a thing. But it's like, it's something that has to be known. Like, you know, when gods are like, because, I mean, when Divine get married, they get married in the Celestial Realm, and it's a big old party. And there was a big old party on Far Fruit Mountain, but then it's like, well, you know what? Wukong is the type to just go up to heaven and be like, I'm married! And just scream it really loud to everybody, and everyone's like, what the fuck is he talking about? Why is he t telling us that he's married? What does that have to do? So it's something that they took note of, and they're like, okay, this stupid monkey is married to this other monkey. And they wrote it down, and they're like, fine. You know, it's kind of just like, it's like getting registered. He had to like kind of get registered in the celestial realm. I don't know if he told Macaque that. <laughs> I don't know if he told him that he got the register. Because <laughs> it's like, you don't need to. If you do the mate day and you follow the ritual, it's like all the demons know, oh, they're mates, you know. Because there's some magic involved. I haven't really been able to go into detail about it. And I don't know if I'm going to go into like what all the, all that happened because it's like I can't go into the epilogue because Macaque is not thinking about that but like there's a lot that goes into a mate day um but yeah he we kind of went up there and just got him registered I don't know I don't think he told Macaque about that Macaque wouldn't have cared at the time he's like oh okay but I think um giving putting his name up there at all gives heaven further credence to look into him. Not that they didn't know about Macaque beforehand. They knew about him when he was born because of the anomaly. But like, this is just extra information <laughs> that they're just like, okay, we'll just put that in the side here. <laughs> but I think that's really funny. The idea of Wukong just going up there and registering and then just shouting that he's married because he's so happy is really, really cute. And I think he would do that. I think you would go around and bother people and be like, hey, guess what? I'm married. <laughs> he would do that. And he would just annoy people because they're like, okay, we don't care. <laughs> there would be some people who care. Wukong did have some friends in the celestial realm, but mo mainly they were stars. And by stars, I mean like the constellations, like the actual 28 constellations and the luminaries because he was goofing off with those people in like distracting them from doing their duties because they were too busy hanging out with this fucking monkey and that's when they gave him the job for the peach to guard the peaches because he was like distracting people and they were like no we need you to be busy with something you can't just like walk around and like bother other people so he has friends they're just like and they were like oh congratulations now i want to write about him registering them in heaven because that's actually really really cute but that is all i have i think 
for the epilogue, I think. Do I have anything else to say? I don't even know how I got on that last subject. Oh, I was talking about monkeys and flower fruit bound. Um, I think next time I should talk about mate day. Because I was thinking about that recently. I was like, I probably need to like iron out the details of everything about May Day. Because I was like, there's there was probably like a marking or something. Because it has to be recognized by demon kind. And I'm like, so that would be easiest by like some magic. <laughs> um, But let's see, is there anything else? I answered all the questions. No? Uh, I think I gave general notes about the epilogue um but we're kind of at the halfway point now we are because i told you that it's going to be 15 instead of 16 um so we're at the halfway point now i hope everyone's liking it so far it's gonna get mm, a bit more mellow or sad well not overall but like there's gonna be i think there's gonna be a good mix of both good and bad things um, but I hope the last leg of the journey is satisfying and fun and there's some funny moments or like enjoyable moments. Uh, I think there will be, but yeah, thank you for reading and listening and sending in questions. There were a lot of questions. If there's any more questions about the things I said and then probably fail to explain, please feel free to send in, um, asks or comments or whatever you want to do. And I will respond to them when I have time. Um, as always, thank you for reading this AU at all, because we're fucking at 19,000 hits on Constellations, and that is terrifying. And we're almost at 850 kudos, which is also terrifying. So, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I, cause I know people have been sharing it. So I guess thank you for sharing it and talking about it and enjoying it because this is a level of attention I'm not really used to but it hasn't really been a bother because I guess people like to keep that in private circles which is fine but it's just like wild to like go look at the numbers um also people keep subscribing to constellations that's that's not going to get updated anymore <laughs> I keep seeing that number go up. I don't know what, I don't know what that's about. It's not going to get updated. That's why I'm like, please subscribe to the epilogue or better yet, subscribe to the watch the star series so you can just see whenever I post something or just subscribe to me or my username. So you'll see everything that I post, no matter what it's for. If you have any questions or anything else, you'd like to ask or if this spurred any questions um let me know and thank you i love you okay bye